Well, welcome to the Your Favorite Book Podcast. I'm Tanner. I'm Mallory. We're siblings, if you can't tell by the way that we look. And we're reading each other's favorite books. And this week, for our first episode, we read Bonesmith. By Nikki Pal Prado. This was my favorite book of 2023. So I had Tanner read it, and now we're going to talk about it. And I hated it. <laughs> no, I didn't hate it. I really did enjoy the book. Good. But okay. We should talk about how you found this and what you thought about it. Yeah, so earlier this year, I was gifted a Fairy Loot subscription, and this was the August 2023 Fairy Loot pick for the YA box. And I really loved it. I read it pretty much as soon as it came, and I finished it in a day, and... I just really enjoyed it. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it too. I'm glad you recommended it to me. Um, we first wanted to do this podcast because we're both big readers for basically our whole lives. Mm -hmm. I kind of slowed down in high school, but then I started picking things up again after I first read um, The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. Yeah. And then ever since then, I've been reading a lot. Um, and this past year, you and I were both keeping track of how many books we were reading mm -hmm. without like necessarily setting a goal, I don't think. Yeah. For me, I didn't. Yeah, I had a goal to read 50 books by the end of the year. Okay. Which I did accomplish fairly. Yay! So, Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I only read 30. That's still a lot of books. <laughs> so you have a lot more authority <laughs> in this realm than I do. Um, this year, I kind of fell back in love with reading. I had someone me recommend... Too the Court of Thorns and Roses mm -hmm. series to me, which led me to devour all of those books. I really enjoyed them. <laughs> um, and I hope you don't have to make me read them. I think I will. <laughs> I think it would be funny. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. Um, yeah, so I read all of Sarah J. Mass's work last year, which was 18 books, I think. So yeah, it's a big chunk of what lot. I read. Um, and then I just fell into book talk and bookstagram and so I've just been meeting a lot of people online and sharing book recommendations mm -hmm. and stuff like that so yeah well the thought occurred to me um before this year began it's currently January 1st <laughs> um that hey we should do a fantasy book podcast we both love books and we keep telling each other about the books we should read I'm like hey I just read you know the powder made trilogy this year you should really read it and then you wouldn't yeah it was, and I'm like, be like yeah what? I'll read it <laughs> we never got never to got it, to it. <laughs> and then you would read something like bonesmith and tell me about it and mm -hmm. be like hmm that reminds me of this book or this book maybe I should read it and then I never would yeah so I was like you know what I actually want to read the books that Mallory keeps recommending mm -hmm. and so, me too yeah and vice versa yeah so why not use this podcast as an excuse to, to do so yeah and I always love talking about stories and books and media. So, yeah, like, this is a good, this is what I love to do. So, we yeah. might as well force ourselves to do it. <laughs> yeah. And it's fun, too. You know, it's, yeah. it is good to have something like a podcast to kind of force yourself to do things mm -hmm. that you initially don't want to do, but then you learn later on, oh, I actually do enjoy this. Yeah. This just isn't a book that I would initially pick up on my own. Yeah. So, I guess to kind of go into that, Normally, what I like to read are really dry, long <laughs> epic fantasy series. Yeah. Some sci-fi stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not really into sci-fi. But this is mostly a fantasy book podcast. Yeah. Although we do plan on reading some sci-fi stuff. Yeah. I usually read YA fantasy. That's my yeah. favorite thing to read. It's what I've read since Percy Jackson and Harry Potter when I was and in Hunger Games. fifth grade. Yeah. So, like... That's kind of what I like, and I definitely, everybody reads stuff that's yeah. not exactly what they read, but that's my normal. Um, I like sci-fi, too, and I like epic fantasy. I haven't read as much as you have, but mm -hmm. um, I'm excited for us to read what each other likes. I know. <laughs> and, like, push us out of our normal. Yeah. Like, I even sometimes will pick up just a trashy romance novel. Yeah. And that is so not my taste. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I could see myself enjoying that experience, even though it wouldn't be one of my favorite books. Yeah, exactly. It's it's going to be interesting to go, like, just to see how much there is outside of what we normally would pick and cater to. Yeah. And see that there's fantastic picks 
all on the spectrum of all genres of books, yeah. you know. And you never know. I might read something that you loved and find that I like it too. And yeah. I might enjoy reading more in that genre and vice versa. Yeah, exactly. So that's what the purpose of this podcast is. That's kind of where it started from. Mm -hmm. And when I asked you what your favorite book this year was, out of 50 books, mm -hmm. out of 18 Moss books, yes. out of even A Court of Thorn and Roses, <laughs> which is apparently the greatest book series ever created, no. or so I've heard, <laughs> your favorite was Bonesmith. Yes. I loved this book. It really pulled me in from the get-go. It had a very non-traditional start to the conflict and the plot, in my opinion. Um, and I loved the characters a lot and the relationships that were built. And I really enjoyed the magic system a lot. I, I just really enjoyed it. Like, it's okay. the kind of book that you read and you're like, ah, this is why I like reading. Yeah. Like, this is why it pulls me in so much and stuff like that. So I was excited to have you read it. I yeah. was a little nervous. <laughs> oh, I was too. I was very nervous to tell you what my favorite book was, to have yeah. you read it. Yeah. Um, and... That was The Assassin's Apprentice, which I know I'm like literally 28 years late on. Uh -huh. But yeah, I had the same worries <laughs> Yeah, that you might not enjoy something that I was like, this is the reason why I live. <laughs> exactly. So I've been nervous about it, um, especially because I know it's not exactly what you read. But I mean, yeah. it's similar. We both Very read similar. fantasy. Yeah. That's a big umbrella. And just to ease your mind, I did really enjoy this book. <laughs> okay, good. I've been sitting on the edge of my seat for yes. a week. <laughs> I know. We've been trying... We see each other all the time. Obviously, we're siblings, live in the same town. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been trying to tell you what I think about it because I wanted to keep all the juicy details. Yeah, for this yeah, me too. So I'm excited to get into it. Yeah. Let's start with the blurb. Yeah, let's do that because people might not know what this book is. Yeah. And if you want to read the book first before yes, you listen spoiler. to it, go for it. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert for Bonesmith. You can find this on Audible, Kindle, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, where all books are distributed normally or sold yes you have to buy the book yeah you do you can't steal it just kidding mm, i'm just kidding it. um all right here's the blurb bonesmith by nikki pal prado in the dominions the dead linger violent and unpredictable unless a bonesmith severs the ghost from its earthly remains for bonesmith wren becoming a valkyr a ghost fighting warrior is a chance to solidify her place in the in the noble house of Bone and impress her frequently absent father. But when sabotage causes Wren to fail her qualifying trial, she is banished to the border wall, the last line of defense against a wasteland called the Breach, where the vicious dead roam unchecked. Ooh, so spooky. spooky. So I love Halloween. I love my spooky books. Um, and that was definitely part of the reason why I was attracted to the story in the first place when you described it to me mm -hmm. is that it did remind me of um, Gideon the Night, yeah. which I read not this year, but the last. Mm -hmm. And I really love that book. Yeah. And that's part of the elevator pitch for this book is Gideon the Ninth meets Game of Thrones is the one that's been said, hmm. um, which I want to read Gideon the Ninth and I know I would enjoy it because I yes. enjoyed this. <laughs> I know you would love it. I would love to talk about, well, I don't know if you would love it. I, I, I think hope I that would you love would. It. <laughs> it is similar to Bonesmith, um, at least in terms of the tone and the world building. Mm -hmm. And there are some elements of like the relationship between the two main characters in Bonesmith, uh, Ren and Ju Julian. Mm -hmm. Um, that's also similar to Gideon the Ninth between Gideon and Harrowhawk. Mm -hmm. um, also, by the way, we're going to mispronounce names all over the place. When yes. you said Valkyr, Is that... I thought Valkyr. That's how oh, I was Valkyr. Heard it. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, just for <laughs> context, when I read the Percy yeah. Jackson series the first time through, I thought it was Zesus because Zeus was king of the gods. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Jesus, Zesus. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'm sorry. Correct <laughs> us if we're saying stuff we're wrong. We're very stupid. Um, everybody definitely, like, especially when you're reading fantasy, you're like, oh, she traveled to yeah. and picked up her weapon named That's true. There is no real canon except for what the author says. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, back to the story. Um, I guess how should we start? We should start by, I guess, explaining the plot. Because we didn't yeah. read the whole blurb, just the first sentence. But mm -hmm. this story is about Ren. Yeah. 
who wants to become a Valkyr. And mm-hmm. it's not about just becoming a Valkyr to be an awesome warrior. It's about what being a Valkyr means to her, mm-hmm. which means uh, obtaining the approval of her distant father. Yeah. Um, from the get-go, you really get this rocky relationship between her seeking his approval, and that's the one thing that she wants more than anything, and she can just never get it. He's He never gives that to her. He's never quite proud enough, even though she's the best in her class, and when she goes through this qualifying trial in the beginning, that's like the first chapter, mm-hmm. um, another student sabotages her, so she's disqualified from becoming a Valkyr. Valkyr, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> yeah. So you said earlier that you thought the introduction was non-traditional and caught your attention right away. Yeah. I usually, I feel like when I read a book, it's like, oh, here's the (gasps) day-to-day. Something changed. Someone got abducted to the fairy world. Mm -hmm. Or someone learned they had magic powers. Um, I really liked this book because it set up this trial that she was going through and then when she won that trial, the rest of her life would begin. Mm -hmm. And that was ripped away from her in the first chapter. And it kind of left me in a spot of, oh, what what is she going to do? Mm -hmm. Like, I was very invested to see how she would try to obtain the same goals when she couldn't complete the trial, couldn't get, couldn't become a Valkyr. Yeah, I totally agree. The um, introduction does throw you right in the middle of the story, Mm -hmm. which I like. I like it doesn't waste any time getting to who these characters are, what they want, and what those things mean to them. Mm -hmm. It's very clear and stated out from the very beginning that she's a student and she's trying to qualify to become a Valkyr. Mm -hmm. And it's for her father's approval. It's like so cut and dry. (laughs) And most of this book is um, very direct and deliberate, and that's a good thing. Even in the dialogue, like, characters speak very honestly with one another. Mm -hmm. Even if it feels a little unnatural, it didn't pull me out of the story. I just wanted to get to write to what these characters were trying to say to each other Mm -hmm. on an emotional level. Yeah. Um, Yeah, and and that is, and it just kept the story moving, you Mm -hmm. know? Like, it never felt like it was uh, overstaying its welcome or... I don't know what the word is. You yeah, know. yeah, it 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 really picked you up and then started moving. meandering. Yeah, there That's you go. That's the word. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> it did not meander. Yeah, <laughs> there was a little bit of a lull, I would say, mm-hmm. after she fails her challenge. Spoiler alert: she fails the challenge. It's in like the first chapter. <laughs> yeah. When she's hanging out at the breach fort, basically she fails the challenge and then she gets exiled. Mm-hmm. And I have some thoughts on how she was exiled. Yeah. That I would like to get to. Okay. But when she's hanging out at the breach fort, she's like, I just need to become a Valkyr again. I just need to become a Valkyr again. Uh-huh. And it's like, well, how? Yeah. And, and then she's kind of hanging out there and doing nothing and waiting for something to come along to yeah. change her life. I definitely And that felt was the where I way. kind of tuned out just a little bit. Yeah. There was a lot of, she was on guard duty. Yeah. Then she walked she around patrols. read a book. <laughs> and then she met an old lady. Like, yeah. it, it did kind of get a little bit slow in that part. Especially compared to the beginning of yeah. killing ghosts like from the get go, yeah. uh-huh. and then to kind of slow down and like you could you could feel her discomfort I think through that, but even I was uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, what I like so much about the introduction is that we meet Inara, mm-hmm. who's her rival. Yeah, she's the same age. She's trying to qualify to become a Valkyr too. They're cousins. Mm-hmm. They're both They're in both strong the competition. The class. Yeah. yeah, she's or Ren is the, of the house of Bone. Bone. What's her last name? Graven? Ren yeah, Graven. Yeah, yeah. So her family, well, I guess they're both members of the House of Bone. Yeah, because they're cousins. Yes. But she is Inara Fell, which is a good name. Mm-hmm. And Ren Graven is a good name, too. Yeah. I Graven got feels very, book. you know, spooky, spooky. Yeah, gravy. <laughs> Ren Gravy. Yeah, there we go. Now it feels more like a Thanksgiving book. <laughs> Um, anyway, they're in strong competition with each other to be the very best, mm-hmm. and I like that com- conflict. Yeah. And then you meet her father, and her father's like, don't disappoint me again. You have to be the best here ever. Yeah. Like, of all time. So they, she sets up these high expectations, this great sense of conflict. We find out later that the reason why her father is so disappointed in her all the time is because she's a goof-em-up. Mm-hmm. She likes to break the rules, yeah, and she's she, a risk-taker. She, and she purposefully 
she's like the class clown a little bit she enjoys rule breaking and she enjoys being like oh look i can do whatever the hell i want yeah and she likes getting in danger Mm -hmm. and i suspect it's because she feels like she doesn't get attention from her father yeah like she's obviously acting out like yeah. as a rebellious 17 year old or whatever mm-hmm. is she 17 in this book i think so she feels like a teenager. i can't remember i'm sorry <laughs> she's of age yes she's 18 yes i don't remember um i only say that because there's a love interest later on yes. that's 20. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway um what was i saying oh there's a lot of good conflict right so mm-hmm. the reason why ren's father is disappointed in her is because he wants her to be his heir. Mm-hmm. Her mother's dead, and she's the only surviving heir of the Graven family, yeah. and she could assume her father's position. Mm-hmm. And her grandmother, Lady, Lady, Lady Smith, Smith Svetlana, mm-hmm. which is kind of a mouthful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she um, is probably even more uh, strict than. Uh, Ren's father. Yeah, I think so too. And she doesn't like Ren because she's a bastard, basically. Yes. yes. Yeah. So you have all these great expectations that are set on Ren, where it's like you have to be the very best, but you're a bastard and everyone hates you. Mm-hmm. And Dinara is like your strongest competition, and Lady Svetlana likes her more than Ren. Yeah. And then she fails the test, and then she gets pulled over to the breach land, where it's like her father's not there, Inara's not there, Svetlana's not there. Mm-hmm. It's just her. And yeah. Odile, who is like, I, I don't know how you say her name. I said Odile, but... Odile. But That's how know. it's spelled. Yeah. O-D-I-L-E. Anyway, and she's a friend of her father's, and she's there to take care of Ren. Mm-hmm. So, to me, it felt like you pull her away from all this great conflict right away, mm-hmm. and then she's just hanging out with this old lady who's, like, friendly with her. She's like, <laughs> hey, I'll take care of you, even though your life sucks. And it's like, her life doesn't really suck that much right now. Yeah. Like, you've well, had plus, all this great conflict, and you kind of just kind of took it away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it definitely kind of felt like getting the air knocked out of you, yeah. out of the story a little yeah. bit. Like, you're like, okay, well then, what are we going to do with all those loose ends, almost? Is yeah, kind of can what we it bring like. back Inara? I yeah. liked that rivalry. Yeah, I would like her so to face fun. the consequences of her actions. That's something that I kind of miss, too. Like she got disqualified from the trial and then got kicked off Mm -hmm. kicked out of school sent to this like dinky punishment sure easy job which i don't know she was still allowed to do all the stuff that she liked to do a little bit so it was it was interesting i mean it was still definitely a punishment because she didn't get to become a valkyr or Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know yeah but it almost kind of felt like isn't that what a Valkyr would do? Wouldn't a Valkyr yeah. be stationed somewhere to protect the borderlands where mm-hmm. ghosts... Or she's, like, right next to the breach. Yeah. Right? Uh, we should explain that, too. But, oh, yes. Um, basically, the primary world-building conflict of the story is that uh, years before Ren was born, some basically some necromancers, they're mm-hmm. called ghost smiths in this world. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, maybe... I, I might have just given that away. It's oh, the ironsmiths. Okay them that they yes, say yeah yeah so basically there's magic deep underground and the iron smiths are mining for it mm-hmm. and they go so deep that they find a ghost smith village yes an ancient ghost smith village and it releases all these dangerous ghosts mm-hmm. and so that's where that's nearby where ren is posted after she's exiled yeah is in this gigantic wall made of bone and marble that's made to repel all those dangerous ghosts yeah so to me sorry no it, you're it, fine it kind of felt like isn't that normally where a valkyr would go if they were like yeah you're going to protect our lands like what the, like what does an anara get to do yeah she is probably doing the same exact thing somewhere else even though yeah. she accomplished the trial yeah and, even though she passed and like another important thing to note with this magic system in this world is that there are people who can use magic regarding materials in the world Mm -hmm. so like a long long time ago there were wood smiths that could use wood magic and by controlling copper smiths by yeah like manipulating and controlling those materials and the main ones we see in this book are bone smiths which can manipulate bones ghost Mm -hmm. smiths which can see the tether between a ghost to their bones Mm, no i don't think that's right what Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Sorry, I got that wrong. Ghostsmiths can, like, talk to ghosts. Yes, 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 yes. In Bonesmiths, there are two different vocations, I yeah. guess. Valkyrs, 
who are in charge of protecting reapers who cut the tether between a ghost and their bones. Yes, and we'll Sorry, get to that later. That um, but the third primary magic system in this story are ironsmiths. Mm -hmm. And ironsmiths can manipulate iron. Yes. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Um, but basically, the reason why bonesmiths fight ghosts is because in this world, ghosts are afraid of undead bone? Yes. Or is it a live bone? No. No, it's undead bone. Undead bone. bone. Okay, I couldn't yes. get that straight. Yes, that's okay. Like, the ghosts are tethered to their live bones, mm -hmm. right? I think that's right. Now I'm questioning myself. Yes. And then, and then once once the ghosts have been reaped from their bones, they disappear. They, disappear. they die. They move on to the next life. And bone smiths can use those undead bones as weapons against the ghosts, or like she has Lords. crushed up bone powder that she can throw at ghosts, which mm -hmm. I thought was interesting. I just think it's funny to think that you're like in this massive battle, and then you throw some dust in someone's eye. Yeah, that'd be very effective. It would be. <laughs> It, but that would annoy me yeah personally yeah <laughs> and if it, i were a ghost it would annoy me too yeah yeah <laughs> um so and ren is also and all the bonesmiths they all wear bone armor mm -hmm. they mentioned in the first chapter that fabricators can like shape undead bone mm -hmm. into whatever form they wish but it's like a specific skill yeah so ren has like bone pauldrons, chest plate, greaves, yeah. you know, and bone weapons. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, it... That stuff was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like we're kind of jumping all over the place. I know, I do too, <laughs> but I, it's fine. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Uh, uh, what The thing that interested me about this book was the, those world-building elements. I like that she wore all bone armor. It set her apart from the other main character, Julian, which we meet later on. Mm -hmm who's an ironsmith, and he can manipulate iron, and he has cool and interesting weapons, which we'll get into. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we just keep on saying that. I know. It's hard. It's hard to... Um, but to go along with that, they also do a very good job, the author, of making the locations feel very interesting. Yeah, and, and very distinct, too. Yeah. Um, it's something I never noticed before in previous books that I had read. Yeah. It made me want to go back and look at the other books that I love and be like, hmm, do you really make these locations feel visually interesting and different mm -hmm. from each other? Yeah, like she does a great job at setting up the atmosphere of each place and especially with the place that she's stationed at. The Breach Fort yeah, is what it's called. Yeah, the Breach Fort. Um, her like mentor guardian is this old reaper named Odile. 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 Sure. Like crocodile. Yeah. Yeah, that she's makes sense. Old and wrinkly yeah. like a crocodile. Yeah. She's this old reaper who has <sighs> some secrets, but she's also kind of like a silly grandma a little bit. Yeah. But I really enjoyed that character. I really liked it. Yeah. Um, but even just when she's training or working with Odile, there's a difference between that atmosphere versus when she's out on guard duty or mm -hmm. something like that. Like, I don't know, it really helped me feel like I was in the book and feel the differences in those kind of yeah. places. For me, I felt like I could actually visualize what those places looked like. Mm -hmm. Like the first setting is the bone forest. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what it's called. The bone forest is what we'll yeah. call it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Where she does her test. You have to pass through the bone forest mm -hmm. to become a Valkyr. And mm -hmm. then she's exiled to the breach fort, which is this massive wall. And this is probably why our people say it's like Game of Thrones. I will say that is the only element of this story that's like Game of Thrones. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. <laughs> I don't know if I agree with that, but... Yeah, I think... Yeah, whatever. People use those, like, comparisons as, like, a marketing tool. Yep. And I think it's kind of silly. Um, anyway, it's a massive wall made of bone, partially mm -hmm. made of bone, partially made of marble. Um, that was easy to visualize, and I could imagine her patrolling up and down the wall yeah. and on top of it and inside of it. That was a really interesting place. Mm -hmm. And then the third and final location is the breach itself yeah. and the hidden ghost myth village. Mm -hmm. And I could see so all of it in my mind's eye. Yeah. And it had different colors and sounds and, you know, and it presented its own challenges too for the plot. Yeah. Um, each of those places. Mm -hmm. Um. Yes, so that was something that I liked. Yeah, I liked that too. Yeah. Um. I, go ahead. No, you go. Okay, I think I, we should talk about um, maybe the 
plot. Yeah. Okay. Like, the beginning of the story. I guess we did kind of talk about that. Not so very well, though. The... We get distracted. Yeah, we did. Good, but... It feels like once we couldn't explain more of the plot stuff until we talked about, like, the world building. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we're kind of talking about the world building. Yes. <laughs> and we're not talking about the characters. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so after she's sent to the breach fort, she works there for, like, a month about, is it? Who knows? I, I think it was a couple weeks. It's too long. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And and I think that's... Yeah. So she's working there, and then Odile is a little bit secretive with some stuff with her, shows her some magic, is just kind of a little bit ambiguous kind of. a little bit to me. Yeah. She's ambiguous about, like, well, Odile knew her... Odile knew... Odile, yeah. I called her Odile. Oh, you did? Yeah, oh, okay. I did on accident. I corrected myself. Oh, okay. Odile knew Ren's father, um, whose name is Grayson or something. I think Grayson? that's here. Let's Your do it. name is Gray. Man, this book is so pretty. I know it's at the very end. It is very pretty. Is this at the end? You said. I know. I know oh. that she she doesn't call him father by the end. She calls him by his first name. Yeah. I can't remember. We could probably Google it. Yeah, probably. Anyway. Daddy Graven. Yes. Um, Mr. Graven. Um, Odile knew Ren's father and um, her uncle, his brother, Locke. And Locke is celebrated as this hero because uh, after the breach, um, there was this great civil war between the Ironsmiths and the Bonesmiths. Mm -hmm. So these two nations are like mortal enemies. Yeah. And um Ren's uncle Locke was this powerful bonesmith who sacrificed himself to kill all of the last Iron Knights mm -hmm. who were trying to attack the House of Bone. Mm -hmm. And he's praised as this great war hero. Yeah. And then... And it feels like Odile is keeping most of the details of what happened there to herself. Yeah, even though she knows all of them. And Ren yeah. has tried to talk to her father about this, and he just shuts it down and doesn't... Yeah. Participate. So I think she's excited to find someone who could help unlock that part of her past, maybe. Um, because she was born while the war was happening. So maybe she wants to ask Odile. Um, Odile. Oh my god. Crocodile. <laughs> maybe she wants to ask Odile, like, did you ever know my mom? Yeah. But she never does, which is, I don't know if that's kind of weird to me. You could have at least put in a line there where it's like, I really wanted to ask, or Ren really wanted to ask about if she knew her mother, yeah. maybe. Or maybe it was, like, too uncomfortable to ask, maybe never occurred to her, but she's still curious about that mm -hmm. event for obvious reasons. Yeah, so, yeah. Odile, Odile is shifty, mm -hmm. but friendly and helpful. Yes. And then, eventually, um, she says, oh, okay, Ren, I'll help you become a Valkyr, and there's a prince coming, and you can get on his good side, and he can help you become a Valkyr again. Yeah, like, Ren... During her time at the Breach Fort, a lot of her internal monologue is, I've got to do something big to prove myself so I can get back yeah. to her home. Or, you know, maybe my dad will see me and take me out of here and give, make me a Valkyr and, yeah. you know, all that stuff. It was a little unclear to me how becoming friends with the prince would help her exactly. Yeah, like I agree. It almost felt like she should have gone on a quest. She should have chosen to go on a quest. To yeah. become a Valkyr again. Yeah, I kind of agree. I was like, okay, so the prince is going to pay for her to come back? Or he's or... going to like go back home and say, like, I met Ren and she's great. You it... can make her a Valkyr again. Yeah, yeah, that was a little bit weird. And also, it kind of seemed like the S Lady Smith, Svetlana, and Daddy Graven. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't know what his name <laughs> Mr. is. Mr. Graven. Mr. Graven didn't seem like the kind of people who would care about a prince, too. So I was like, yeah. what would the prince be able to do? And there's, like, several princes, and this is one of the younger ones, so, like, he's not even mm -hmm. in line for the throne. He's or... the third prince. Yeah, He's not yeah. even that important. So it was, it was interesting. Um, it was unclear her, how she could become a Valkyrie again. Yes. And that was a problem for me. Yeah. Is because it felt like she was exiled. She wanted to come a, become a Valkyrie again, but I didn't know how. Yeah. I didn't know what her plan was. Her father said, follow the rules, and then you'll become a Valkyrie again. Mm-hmm. Well, then, could the rest of the book just be her being Boring. <laughs> a guard for the next 20 years? Yeah. 
because they mentioned earlier that you can become a Valkyr by like going back to school and then trying out again in the Bonewood Trials the next year. Mm -hmm. So I thought, like, why couldn't, is, that why couldn't she do that? Option. But she was exiled. Yeah. And we, we don't even know what that means. Yeah. Does exiled mean you can never become a Valkyr again? Yeah, it was a little, it was pretty unclear. And being that it was so unclear as an audience member, I wanted Ren to recognize yeah. that. Like, I wanted her to be like, how the hell am I supposed to do this? It's impossible. I guess I'll give up. Yeah. That would at least be interesting. Yeah. Instead, she's like, I'm trying to become a Valkyr again by going on patrol duty. It's like, what? <laughs> this where's the reasoning? Yeah, yeah. We need to know what these rules are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and that would have been nice to explain, too, if she, like, fails the Bonewood trial. Mm -hmm. Um, And she gives up Ghost Bane, which is this ancestral blade. Yeah. Like, the symbol of her father's trust in her is, like, his heir. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that means so much to her, where it's like, if I have Ghost Bane, that means my father loves me and still believes in me. I have to give it up because I failed. Yeah. What a huge disappointment. Well, what does that mean, exactly, when yeah. you're exiled? Yeah, there was... So, it was, there were some bumps at the beginning, I would say. Yeah, I agree. And it almost felt like the author wanted to get to this plot where it's like, I want two people from different nations that are like in a blood feud with each other. Mm -hmm. They're enemies, they don't trust each other, but they're forced to work together to save a prince or whatever. Yeah. Leo, Prince mm -hmm. Leo, um, who is the human MacGuffin. <laughs> <laughs> at first, I'll say at first, he's a human MacGuffin. Um, and then at the end, they fall in love. But... Mm -hmm. uh, and it felt like that was the story they wanted to tell. Yeah. And they were yeah. kind of rushing through these other plot points to, to kind of to get to that. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Um... Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I, no, it's I okay. I feel like I'm shitting on this book. I'm not shitting all over it. No, you're I will say my initial, um, uh, can we swear on this podcast? <laughs> I think so. I think that's fine. I did it without even thinking. Um, but uh, uh, my initial impression of this book, was not overly positive because of those first two scenes. Yeah. Where it's like, I felt like she failed Bonewood Trial, but not that badly. Yeah. Her father was disappointed, but not that disappointed. He was like, it's okay, just be obedient. Mm -hmm. And she didn't say, how to become a Valkyr again. Yeah. And he didn't even say, like, you lost Bo Ghost Bane. Like, you're a horrible daughter. Right? Like, that's their family heirloom weapon. Shouldn't he weapon. bring that up? And, and she even... Inara has one as well, mm -hmm. and they gamble it. They're like, whoever gets there yes. first gets the other person's family heirloom. Yeah. It, and I if she won that and got her family heirloom, then it would have been like, wow, she's the greatest Valkyrie yeah. ever, apparently. Yeah. Um, and then they never kind of touch on it ever again. No. And I, she doesn't even give Ghost Bane to Inara. Yeah. She gives it back to Lady Svetlana, yeah. which is confusing. Yeah. Um, it would have been so much better if she shows up at the Bonewood trial at the end and she mm -hmm. failed. And she's like, not only did you not become a Valkyr, Inara walks up to her and is like, you have to give me Ghostbane now. Yeah, in and front of her everybody. her father watches of... her give up Ghostbane to Inara, yeah. who's like the main rival of the house of, of, of the Graven family. Yeah. That, that would have been, been so been much really better. Powerful. It's almost like as if you're threatening to punch someone in the face and then you flick him in the forehead. <laughs> like, why would you take that away from me? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely interesting. I agree with that. But it's, like I said, it gets better after these first two scenes. Mm -hmm. And I did enjoy the book and I'm interested in reading the sequel. Yeah. Because they find out what the true, they know what their internal, sense of internal conflict is for Ren. Mm-hmm. It, she wants to become a Valkyr again so that her father loves her. Yeah. It's just some of the rules of, like, how you become a Valkyr again, they're what it means shady. to be a Valkyr, they're, they're unclear. Yeah, they don't make sense yeah. completely. Um, I really, I don't know what I was going to say. No, that's okay. <laughs> I, look, you read this book a while ago. I did. I read it in November. And I just barely finished reading it, and uh -huh. I took notes. So yeah. I have a much clearer memory of these things. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at it, honestly, I wasn't trying to look at it with a critical eye, but I was just trying to ask myself why I about? did or didn't like yeah. certain things. Yeah. So. I I really liked, I really liked when Prince Leo shows up. Yes, the let's talk about that. The prince comes to the breach. Yeah. And in the customs of this world, there's supposed to be a representative with him from each 
person of the breach, like each yeah. something or other. And I didn't it, understand that. I didn't understand that either, but it was like there's supposed to be a bone smith with, with him. Royalty and it has was shown supposed up. to be Yeah. Royalty has shown up and everyone is going to be there, right? Yeah. And it was supposed to be Odile was the one who was supposed to be like the bone smith representative, but mm-hmm. she's like, Oh, I feel sick. So that and makes Ren, Ren be there. Be there. Yeah. And so Ren's like, Oh great, this is my chance to get to know the prince, get on his good side and become a Valkyr again. And they really hit it off from the get-go, which was fun. They're mm-hmm. both kind of irreverent and both don't want to be where they are with the people that they are. And so they kind of get along from the get-go. And there's a lot of fun banter between the two of them. And the way that, so they meet each other in the hall and they flirt in front of everybody. Yes. Which was uncomfortable. Yes, it was. And it was <laughs> and like. And they get drunk. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and then like and party yeah they party and <laughs> with but, all the nobles there but, and i did like that so like the prince is a goldsmith yeah that's his thing so he's like covered in gold jewelry covered in gold because he's rich and magic mm-hmm. or whatever but no one really knows what goldsmiths do like it kind of was like, like yeah, your he's not that useless. magical or something like that which i was like okay that's interesting that'll come up later probably <laughs> but it doesn't um and oh, it, it, it does. does it does a little bit but even yeah. still you're like okay uh, they were right it's not that cool <laughs> yeah. goldsmiths are really kind of useless yeah, that's why they're to, royalty compared to the people who can you know commune with the dead mm-hmm. or uh, control iron yeah yeah and so while they're drunk leo says some weird stuff and ren is like well what's wrong with you what like does he say? like isn't he he like implies that he's going to die soon i think oh yeah he is um obviously getting drunk to drown himself in his woes and miseries yes. as like a spares spare is what he describes himself mm-hmm. as because he's the third prince yeah and he hates that he has to basically he's basically like a health food inspector yeah he's but a for the royalty yeah <laughs> yeah where he goes around to all these different uh places along the border of their country to like check up on them and make sure like you're doing a good job you're guarding the border yeah yeah. So he hates his life. Yeah, he does. And so But he does feel like his life is also under threat, maybe, which is what you're saying. Right? Yes, yes. So he's and Ren is kinda like, okay, whatever. That was weird. And then the next day they're gonna go out on border patrol mm-hmm. with the prince, right? Okay, I have a couple of things to say before we get to that point. Okay. Okay, so uh Le- Prince Leo and Ren, this is what this section of the podcast is. Yes. All right. Okay. So when I think this would really have helped this second section of the book. I guess it's still part of the first act. The end of the first act Mm -hmm. when Ren is patrolling at the breach. Yeah. So when she's patrolling at the breach, Odile is showing her around and she's just kind of bored, like hanging out. And then she says, a prince is coming to save you. Yeah. (laughs) Basically. Um, And the comparison I made was like, it would kind of be like if Harry went to Hogwarts and it was just him and Dumbledore hanging out all day. (laughs) Like, teaching him some spells here and there, like, showing yeah. him some secrets. It's like, there's no Malfoy, there's no Snape, there's no, there's nothing in the way of his, of him accomplishing his goals. Yes. So, it would have been nice if, like, Commander Duncan, she mentions this character, Commander Duncan, mm-hmm. um, who's in charge of the breach fort. It would have been nice if Commander Duncan was like, you're never, ever, ever going to become a Valkyr. Yeah. I'm friends with Lady Svetlana, and I hate you because you're a bastard. You know, whatever his motivation is. Mm -hmm. And then he would, like, get in her way. Yeah. And then Odile says, hey, there's a prince coming. Maybe you can get on his good side. Mm -hmm. I'll pretend to be sick, and you can become friends with him. Um, And then Commander Duncan could be doing everything to get in her way. Yeah. And then Ren shows up, and she's like, or Commander Duncan will be like, where's Odile? And Ren would be like, she's sick, sorry, I'm the only one here. You know, something that would get in the way of her making friends with the prince. But yes. like I said, I think they're just trying to really get past this part of the story to get yeah. to the actual story that they wanted to tell. Yeah, there. Th- I definitely agree with that. It would have been much more interesting to read those chapters where she was just doing her job. Yeah. That's all she was doing. <clears throat> um, And, like, it was... <laughs> good <laughs> nice this is our dogs yes um what was i saying it would i was talking about how like it'd be nice to have commander duncan get in the way of her goals while she's yes like, for it. yes you said it'd been nice to like hear about how she's completing her jobs at the patrol no i think i think it was so boring yes and, and, and even ren was like i'm gonna try to do it i'm gonna try to follow the rules for once in my life yeah but 
it would have been interesting if she was still trying to commit that, commit yeah. to that, and have Duncan be like, "I'm going to screw up all your stuff. Yeah, like I'm going to get in the way and make it seem like you're messing up, even if you aren't. Even or though she's being something. a good girl and doing the yeah. right thing. Yeah. Or it'd been interesting if like Prince Leo comes along, and the way for her to follow the rules is by never talking to him. That's what Commander Duncan says or something. Yeah, yeah. And then she has to break the rules to talk to Prince Leo, which is a risk that she's willing to take because maybe she can become friends with him and become a Valkyrie. Yeah. That would have been so much more interesting if there was something at stake. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's like she hangs out at the breach fort, Prince Leo comes along, they become best friends right away, and then she doesn't even have to leave her room to sneak into his. To no, like he sneaks become... into her room, I right? I know. <laughs> which is like, why don't you just do it the other way around? Yeah. It would be so much more interesting if there was something at risk, mm -hmm. you know, It and it was kind of like a pattern of this shying away from conflict Yeah. from like the first chapter where it's like she fails the House of Bone trial, but mm -hmm. not that badly. Yeah. Like you're supposed to show up before dusk and you have to kill three ghosts. And That's you have to qualify. get, and you have to get your Reaper across with you. Yeah. And she doesn't complete any of those tasks. Yes, she does. She oh, completes she, two she, of those Yeah, she tasks. completes two of the three. Her Reaper even survives. Yeah, it but been she so doesn't more get there with them. I don't no. know. I don't know. It's interesting. Anyway, <laughs> she loses Ghost Bane. Her father doesn't mention it. And he's like, just follow the rules. I'm not that disappointed in you. You know, I feel like I'm shitting on this book again. But it's just <laughs> these small problems where it's like, you could just push the conflict a little bit further. And it would yes. be so much more interesting. Yeah, I agree. I still liked it. I was still entertained. Mm -hmm. And the story got so much better once they end entered the second act yes and and like i think oh my gosh you keep on starting to talk and i'm forgetting what i was gonna say so it's okay Darn it. but i was talking about how like maybe it was like prince leo entering into her room instead of her breaking into his room yes okay so like yeah. we keep on saying that part kind of dragged on yeah and it's interesting that we can feel that she wants to get to the second act sooner mm -hmm. and she took so much time to get to the second act yeah do you know what i mean like it was it's just an interesting juxtaposition yes i don't know is. if i use that word right yeah it is okay those perfect. juxtapositions when you're comparing two things next to each other yeah yeah yeah. okay um yeah because um relative to the rest of the story honestly the first act is pretty short yeah um but it feels like it goes on for a long time because in comparison to the rest of the book it is so much less interesting. Yes, there's so much less conflict, so much less. Just, they're just less. Yeah, there is. Which Especially maybe, in the maybe that's work. what she was going for. Maybe the author was trying to be like, this is mundane. This yeah. Is, you know, I could see that maybe. But maybe, but I would made still. It more interesting. I agree, but still letting go of those things like, how do you become a Valkyr once you've been exiled? Mm -hmm. That would even that would help a lot. Yeah. Where it's like Ren believes. In 10 years, if she does her guard duty, she'll become a Valkyrie. Yeah. So she's trying to keep her nose clean. But then, uh-oh, some things show up where it's like the prince comes around and she yeah. has to break the rules yeah. to speed her, to fast track her way to yeah. becoming the Valkyrie. Yeah. Stuff like that would really help. Mm -hmm. And they're just minor changes. Yeah. Right? Um, so we should talk about the second out of act of the book. Because yes. obviously we have a much more positive opinion of it. <laughs> Yes. Then the first third. Yes. Or the second. The... Whatever. You know what I'm saying. Yes. <laughs> we should talk about the second of the act of the book because it's much better. Yeah. <clears throat> so how does Julian get introduced to the okay. story? Okay. So. Or I guess how does Ren leave the breach for? Yeah. So Prince Leo is like, okay, I gotta go on my guard patrol and check the borders, and Ren gets assigned to his protective detail. Yeah. She's the only bone smith. Yeah, she's the only bone smith there. And so she's like, okay, it's up to me. I got to make sure this prince makes it out alive. And the whole time, Leo seems super on edge. He's super frantic. And she's like, okay, maybe he's just hung over because, you know, they just drank their lives away the night before. Mm -hmm. um, and while they're traveling there, there's like a tree felled into the Mm -hmm. road right i think there might have been an avalanche yeah they, something like that their wagon their carriage gets stuck because the road is blocked uh, yeah and leo is like oh shit something's gonna go down and she kind of is seeing that and is like okay maybe he was serious when he was saying he's worried someone's gonna try to kill him like mm -hmm. you know and so she gets out and investigates and everybody else gets out and investigates and then a whole bunch of ironsmiths come in and try to abduct Leo. 
Not Iron Smith. Not Iron Smith? There's only one Iron Smith. Okay, there's one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> there's one Iron Smith and then just a whole bunch of people. A soldiers right? from the Iron Citadel. Yes, right? yes. Okay. Um, They try to abduct Leo, and so she's trying to protect him and trying to... Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's trying to protect him. And... Run away into the woods. Yeah, they run into the woods, and... On the way... And these are the dangerous woods. Yeah. That's next to the breach, right? So there could be ghosts in there. Yeah, like, inside of the border, there's not that many ghosts, and there's a lot more protection and stuff, but outside of the border, it's free reign. It's called the haunted territory. Yes, yes. Yeah. And she... She's protecting Leo yeah. until she runs into an ironsmith. Mm-hmm. So, and an ironsmith is covered head to toe in dark, heavy metal... Armor. Yeah, armor. Mm-hmm. Um, and because Iron Smiths can control iron, which I thought this was cool, yeah. they're basically like living metal. So you see like knight, like real knight armor, and it's really cool how like you can see the foot bend all the way, like they're super flexible. Yeah. So I imagine it's like that, but like ten times thicker and more heavy. Yeah, because they can, use, they can use their, their magic, magic to manipulate yeah. all of that. And like there's there's also this interesting magic rule about Iron Smiths where you should never wield more than your body weight. She calls it the law Something of like ratios. That. Yeah, which it has I to be one to one. Interesting. I thought that was interesting. It was yes. a weird thing to throw in, but I like weird stuff like that. Yeah. Um, which I'm sure will come in later in the book. Where, anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just I just love this book a lot. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's so, she's trying to protect Leo, and in the process, gets stuck in a ravine with. Well, what I can't remember how the... Ren and Ren and Julian get into a fight. Okay, yeah. Right, and she throws bone dust into his face after Leo knocks his mask off. That's right. That's right. So, Ren and the Iron Smith are fighting, and Ren mentions over and over again how bone weapons are obviously not as strong as steel or iron. Mm-hmm. But she has to use them to fight anyway. If there's no way that she can kill an Iron Smith, yeah. So she's tussling on the ground with this Iron Smith. Somehow Leo picks up the Iron Smith's weapon. Hits him over the head with it, knocks his helmet off, and that way Ren can throw some of her bone dust into his face. Yes. And choke him out, basically. Yes. Um, and then two riders from the Iron Citadel come and capture Leo mm-hmm. and take him away while Ren is fighting Julian. And then Julian is standing over Ren and is about to kill her when she sees one of those other soldiers turn around with a bow and shoot Julian in the chest. Yeah, and she's like... There's no way they were aiming for me. It's yeah. definitely a purposeful trying to shoot the Iron Smith that we've seen. Which is confusing. Yes. Because and, they're supposed to be pals. Yeah, they're supposed to be on the same team. And the guy who shot him takes his helmet, too. Mm-hmm. Takes Julian's helmet, too, with the prince or whatever. As like a trophy. Uh-huh. And then... But when she sh- when he's shot, he falls into a ravine. Mm-hmm. So the breach lands is filled with crevasses and cliffs and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And um, Julian has, oh, we should have explained this. So, okay. This is the coolest part <laughs> in the whole you, book. You go ahead and explain It's this. my favorite part. Yeah. It's his, so like we said earlier, the ironsmiths can manipulate iron. And so their armor and their weapons would be like unusable for other people. Yeah. And they have unique qualities about them. His sword he has a sword and he can use his magic to detach it into a rope with metal blades along the edge it's purposefully designed that yeah, way yeah yeah so that it can turn into like a serrated whip yeah basically yeah it's, it's a good way to describe it's a good way to describe it, it. i wonder if, i think it's in the picture in the back yes. not that anyone can see it from here please enjoy my fairy loot special edition there is no way they can, can see that, that. but <laughs> You can look it up. Yeah, look it up. Someone look it up. But it's a really cool weapon that he can use as both a sword and as a whip. Mm-hmm. And it comes into play later on, which I really like. Mm-hmm. Um, for reasons outside of combat, which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, but he uses his whip sword to wrap it around Ren's leg as she tries to run away after throwing the bone dust in his face. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he gets shot with the arrow, he falls into the crevasse and the sword is still in his grip. And he pulls Ren into the crevasse with her. Yes. Um, yeah. The soldiers ride off after looking for both of them. Mm-hmm. They don't see either of them when they look into the crevasse, even though they landed on a red ledge, like maybe 10 feet below or whatever. Yeah. 
Um, and Ren is conscious when they're looking for them, and she pulls his body underneath a little alcove yeah. to hide him from the soldiers. Yeah. Um, and then they're both stuck in this crevasse for a while, mm-hmm. and they're both trying to decide, are we going to kill each other? And then they're kind of like, oh, we could use each other to yeah. get what we want. Yes. Like, this kind of changes, this is where their goals change a little bit. Um, because Ren wants to go save Leo, and she's like, oh my gosh, if I can get the prince back, then, mm-hmm. then I'll, become, I'll a become a Valkyr. So her and goal doesn't change, point, but the way. I'm like, finally. That's the clear goal that we can see, that we can understand yes. as readers, and we can... It makes sense. Yes. You save the prince, then you get a boon. Yes. Right? That, that's easy to understand. Yes. And you're like, okay, she finally, can do this. The story's beginning. She's working towards the goal. Yes, yes. But and she needs this iron... Re, uh, what's his name? Ironsmith. Iron Smith self. I almost called yes. him an Iron Revenant. Yeah. That comes up later. <laughs> yeah. So she's like, she can't do it without him because Julian knows the train, knows where they've taken the prince because mm-hmm. you know that's his people who took him, and Julian and he wants to get the prince back to get too. the prince back too because he wants the credit. He wants to achieve whatever their original goal was in capturing him yeah. in the first place. Obviously, he didn't expect his people to betray him. Yeah. And he wants to know why. Yeah, and he's kind of grappling with that to be like, oh my gosh, those people just tried to murder me. Mm-hmm. What? Um, Ren has a good motivation for wanting to save the prince. Yeah, Julian's so a little he. bit... It, it is good, but it's a little less clear than hers. Yes. But I mean, he's the he's a secondary character that has just been introduced, so he's mysterious. Yeah. <laughs> but here's... I do have a small problem with this as well. Um, at this scene, it's really important that you explain why these two mortal enemies who were just trying to kill each other should trust each other again. Yeah. And why they wouldn't turn each other's backs on mm-hmm. each other. Why they wouldn't turn their backs on each other Yeah. Um, at any given moment. Like, mm-hmm. why do they need each other to survive, to go through the uh, haunted territory? Yes. that's. They're like, hey, the quickest way to get to the prince is to go through the haunted territory. And Ren's like, okay, let's go. But he's a little bit more apprehensive because he is not a bone smith and she is. She needs he needs her to help deal with the ghosts. Yes. To tra- traverse but this. But here's the crazy thing. <laughs> Ren does not bring that up to him. That's a good point. <laughs> she doesn't say that at all. But there's like small things in this book. Like I'm saying. Um on paper, uh-huh. this is a good story. When you actually read it, there's like a few things that just feel a little bit off like this. Yeah. Where it's like, why would Ren not say, You need me, you to, get need me to get through the haunted territory mm-hmm. to save the prince. She doesn't mention it. Yeah. Why? I don't know. That's she just weird. Says, That's the whole reason why they're working together. Yeah. She literally just says, you need to trust me. Yeah. And then he's like, okay, I trust you. <laughs> I'm not joking. Yeah, he's That's like, okay, well, we've just both been raised to hate each other from day one. But and sure, we're, we're I'll forget that history. Yeah, two seconds ago, we were at each other's throats. Yeah. But you're right. We need to work th- together to survive through the haunted lands. Yeah. Why don't you bring up That's that good he point. needs her help to kill the ghosts? Anyway, yeah. she could have said that. Literally just put in one sentence mm-hmm. and it would have fixed it. Yeah. It's... A sm- it's an easy problem to solve, but it's kind of a big thing to forget, don't you think? Yeah. I'm sorry. I, well, once again, well, I'm trying not to shit on no, this book. No, it's okay. It's okay. I did enjoy this book, <laughs> but there are some small problems that just kind of drove me up the wall. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, yeah. in, in every forced proximity, mortal enemies think. Yes. There are conversations of, you can't do this without me. Do you think I would want to go through this with you? Yeah. Like, I don't like, trust you, but you yeah. need my help. Yeah. Um, it's a little strange. That is a little bit weird. That is weird, for sure. Yeah. So the relationship to me did not start off on the right foot, Mm -hmm. and I could see where it was going to end up a mile away. Yes. Which is fine. Yeah. Like we talked about earlier, we liked clear, direct goals. Yes. We want to know how Ren can become a Valkyrie, and Mm -hmm. we also know that these two are going to go from enemies to lovers. Yes. I mean, it's YA fantasy. Yes. It's going to (laughs) happen, people. They're going to bone in Bonesmith. Um, but I'm okay with predictable yeah. as long 
as it's told well. Yeah. As long as there's a good story from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And from point A, it does not start off that strongly, yeah. in my opinion. Just yeah. for that fact alone. Yeah, I can definitely see that. It's like, it seems like sometimes the author kind of implies stuff yeah. that you don't need to imply. You can just yeah. say it. Right. right? Well, it's not even implied that she can help him because she's a bonesmith. Oh, I thought it was. Like, at the very least, she could have implied it. Yeah. I reread this chapter three times. <laughs> I'm serious. Because I'm yeah. like, how do you miss this? Why? Yeah. That is the thing that bothers me about this relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And that must be the reason why I, I'm, I'm not invested in these two at the yeah. beginning. Eventually, I do grow to like them. And mm -hmm. I want them to get together. And she does a good job towards the end at keeping them away from that. Yeah. But at the beginning, that foundation is so important to get right. Mm -hmm. um, and that feels like a pretty big error, yeah. in my opinion. I agree. I didn't even, I didn't even think of it. No, it's I mean, okay. Like, like, yeah. Like I said, when I was reading this, I was taking notes. I didn't mean to look at it with a critical eye, but I couldn't help it. Yeah. Um, that's just how I read books. Yeah, that's fine. I think about why I like them and why I don't. Mm -hmm. And so these sort of things kind of stood out to me. Yeah. Especially because of the other problems that you talked about in yeah. the first it, two it, acts. It kind of feels like the same kind of thing. Like, yeah. Like, it's getting so, so close to what you're wanting to achieve. Yeah. But if you just elevated it one step further, you'd be nailing it. Exactly. Yeah. Just reordering things a little bit here and there, pushing the conflict a little bit in this direction yeah. would make it so much more interesting. Right? Yeah. So the bones are there, haha, <laughs> for a good story. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is why, I, well, I kept read, reading for the podcast. Mm -hmm. If I'm being honest, if I was reading this on my own, I don't think I would have finished it. Yeah. Because those few areas at the front kind of pulled me out of it. Yeah. But I'm glad we're doing this podcast because I don't want to be a reading perfectionist. <laughs> yeah. Because I was entertained by the end of this book, honestly. Uh -huh. And I, and if we weren't doing this podcast, I would have read the sequel. Yeah. I can honestly say that. Yeah. It was entertaining, mm -hmm. and there are good things about this story. Yeah, it's just these small issues. They that add just up kind of, too, yeah, especially when it's something as like they're like story issues. Yeah, they structure are. issues. Like it's hard to just be like, oh. Yeah, I can just brush that away. Yeah, and I could honestly, I I really could, mm -hmm. and you can still see value in things like Ren's internal conflict about wanting to become a Valkyrie to impress her father. Yeah, that's good, mm -hmm. and her teaming up with Julian, who's an ironsmith. These people are supposed to be extinct. Yeah. Because they almost wiped out the entire world, I guess. Yeah, I think I think they were in a civil war at least. Yeah. with the House of Bone. Yeah. They were at war with the Bonesmiths. Mm -hmm. Ironsmiths aren't supposed to exist anymore. And she's finding herself falling in love with this very handsome yeah. prince. Yeah. Um who's supposed to be her arch nemesis. Yes. All of that stuff is good. The mm -hmm. relationship conflict is good. The internal conflict is good. Even the plot is good. Mm -hmm. Like building up towards Ren and Julian trying to save the prince is yeah. good. And all that stuff was entertaining. Um, I keep on qualifying this story. <laughs> but it's just those small things at the beginning that I kept on expecting. And this is horrible to say. But after finding those errors, I kept expecting there to be more. Yeah, so I can understand that. That was just the frame of mind I was at the beginning, mm -hmm. but it was changed by the end. Well, that's good. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it's hard when you are reading a story like that, and there are issues in the first stuff. Mm -hmm. That's why I hated A Court of Thorns and Roses. The first book is bad. Right. And the whole fandom <laughs> collectively recognizes that, and they're like, just get to the second one. It's so much better. I'm yeah. Like, why? Why would I waste time? Yeah. Only to find something good at the end. Like, why couldn't you just match right. that? I don't know. I, I know what you're saying. but um, And that's usually how I read books. Mm -hmm. And I think that limits my palate. Yeah. You know, I don't want to just read, oh, I only read The Weight of Kings. Mm -hmm. Right? Because it's like the best fantasy for me. Yeah. Right? I also want to read stuff by smaller authors or stuff uh -huh. that, you know, isn't that popular or isn't as high quality. Yeah. Because I did learn a lot from reading this book, tons. Mm -hmm. And it was inspirational, and I was entertained. Yeah. It's not one of my favorites, but yeah. I'm glad I read it. Yeah, you can still learn stuff even if you're not in love with it. Yeah. Actually, I think I learn more by reading books or yeah. watching movies or comics that I don't love. Yeah. Because I can ask myself why. Yeah. What was the difference between that and this other thing that I love? Yeah. 
And it makes you appreciate the things you love even more, too. Because mm -hmm. you recognize, oh, they did consider these things. And now when people ask me, why do you like that book? I can point specifically to those reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think it's nice to have that critical view other than just like, I just don't know. I just... Yeah. Or, oh, yeah, I just love it. Yeah. Without being able to look at, I mean, that's, I feel bad. But that feels like kind of what's happening to you for this book, right? Yeah. I, I think, I think. I can definitely understand that. I definitely read it so fast and read it so... Yeah. That I... But I don't know. I think I definitely can point to things that I liked about this. Like, yeah, I really course. did enjoy the world building a lot. Like, mm -hmm. the different atmospheres that we were talking about was definitely interesting. And I really enjoyed the characters a lot. And I really loved how the relationships worked between Leo and Ren, where we get a platonic relationship between mm -hmm. the two of them which Even we don't have see so that a lot common. yeah right. in ya it's usually the first oh the cute boy, boy. <laughs> oh my gosh i'm in love <gasps> the second moody one i mm -hmm. have to pick i right. hate that that's gross barfo i'll still read it but i won't like it oh my god <laughs> <laughs> yeah although we could talk about that. I can talk about the whole thing. Okay, I only read the first so one. Much. I was in middle school. I don't remember it. <laughs> I have so many thoughts and opinions about the Hunger Games. Okay, well, we'll have to yeah. talk about that series. Yeah, then. but I liked how in this we got a more unique relationship between the initial boy mm -hmm. and the main character. Like, yeah. I really, I really liked that. She didn't just fall in love with the prince that came to save her from no. her boring life. Yeah, and they really are just really great friends. Like, like... I don't yeah, know. They are. I really enjoyed that. Um, but I definitely do see the things that you're seeing, and it's I just hope it those small. Spoil this book for you. No, I still love this book. Okay, yeah, good. don't worry. Um, I'm hoping you'll do the same for me when we talk about Assassin's. Don't Apprentice. worry, I'm planning on it. Okay, just good. kidding. <laughs> yeah, bring lots of notes. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about that one. Yeah. Um. But. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think we could pretty quickly wrap up the story of this yeah. book without giving away too much stuff yeah um but basically we've set up what the main adventure of this book is the beginning of the second act julian and ren are forced to work together even though the reasons why they have to work together aren't explained very well mm -hmm. we understand that that is what the story is about accept yes. it and move on yes julian and ren have to work together to fight through the haunted forest or sorry haunted, haunted territory, territory. Um, which is a shortcut to cut off the Iron Citadel, is what I'm calling them, mm -hmm. to save the prince and bring him back mm -hmm. to... Well, Ren's plan is to save the prince and bring him back to the Breach Fort so that she can become a Valkyr again. Mm -hmm. But Julian has other plans. Yeah. And what they tell each other at the beginning is like, let's not worry about what's going to happen when we get the, get the prince. Yeah. Because we're going to come back to being Someone's going to hurt the other person. Yeah. And, and I did enjoy that. I liked how from Me the too. beginning they were like, hey, we can be on the same path up to a point. Mm -hmm. Let's just not worry about it till we get there. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. Yes. And it showed how both of them both of them think they're right the whole book. Yeah, Which they is do. Which I enjoyed. I thought that was fun how they're both like, no, I'm right. No, I'm right. Yeah. And like, this is a good example of they both agree not to worry about it because they both think that they're going to get away with their plan. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Which was cool. Yes. That um, anticipation mm -hmm. of that moment is what kept me reading mm -hmm. throughout the rest of this book. Yeah. Up until then, I was kind of like, oh, no, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> yeah. Um. But when they finally decided, here's our goal, mm -hmm. and here's the conflict, we're enemies, but we're forced to work together, and mm -hmm. until we reach Leo, we know that there's going to be a big explosion. Yeah. Big dramatic thing. Yeah. Um, and that, that is the best part of the book, mm -hmm. really. Um, and when they finally get to that point, then she gets back into Ren's character mm -hmm. and her original reason for doing all of this, which is, we won't get into yet. Yeah, yeah. But um, that was when I realized, ah... Okay, they did have something to say. Mm -hmm. They remembered Ren's character, and she has a great arc. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, we'll get into that later. Yeah. Um, we should talk about the actual adventure to yes. saving Leo. Yeah, so they are traversing through the haunted territory, which no one should go into. Like, mm -hmm. people avoid this area because it's so haunted. And Julian knows that the Iron Citadel have to go the long way around to get back to their coastal home town base. Or whatever. Yeah, their coastal town. But he's like, we could take a shortcut through mm -hmm. this area, so let's do it. 
and they run into some... And Ren likes taking risks. Yeah, Ren... So she's like, this sounds exciting to me. Yeah, she's like, hell yeah, sign me up. Why didn't we just start here? Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And they run into a lot of issues, and we also... In the beginning of the book, we get some pretty clear rules and pretty pretty clear... um, Yeah, pretty clear rules that the ghosts follow Mm -hmm. in Ren's world. Like, they have different level, like, category... Tier levels. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Tier levels of ghosts. Like, this one's the most powerful. This one's what you see the most often. Blah, 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 blah. And it goes from one to five. Yeah. One being the weakest and five being the most powerful. Yeah. And they call tier five ghosts revenants. Yes. Yes. And as soon as she starts meeting ghosts in the breach area outside of her enclosed protected mm-hmm. area, she sees that the ghosts do not follow the same rules that they have. So, so it's interesting to see her, her having to adapt and learn with stuff that she doesn't know how to handle. Mm-hmm. Um, Another rule of the ghosts, we've talked about this before. Um, and I do, I'm sorry, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> I have problems with the world building. Uh-huh. In terms of the tone, I really enjoy it. Like mm-hmm. I said, I loved getting the knife and I love Halloween. Yes. I like my oofy spooky themes. Yes. Um, all that stuff is good, but in terms of the actual world building itself, mm-hmm. I've read some things that felt similar to this, but were more interesting to me, mm. and I couldn't help but compare the two. Yeah. So, like we said, you can dispel a ghost mm-hmm. with bone, and that's why Ren has bone weapons. Mm-hmm. And we mentioned this earlier, but bone smiths travel in pairs. Mm-hmm. There's a Valkyr, and the Valkyr fights the ghost. They're basically like a ghost warrior. Yeah. And the Reaper. And the Reaper is supposed to find the ghost's skeleton and sever it from the ghost. The ghost yeah. Using a scythe. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming it's a bone scythe. Yeah. Um, I couldn't remember if I read it. I don't I, I don't thought know it was like a silver yeah. scythe or something. I think it's a bone scythe. I went back and looked at it mm-hmm. because I was thinking about it. And it's never stated explicitly whether or not it's made of bone. Oh, okay. But we can safely assume she uses a bone yes. scythe. A reaper uses a bone Yeah, and, and there's two separate trainings. Yeah. Two. And Ren is a Valkyr, mm-hmm. which is unfortunately, I'm sorry to say this, the less interesting part of the magic system. Yeah, it's kind of like, oh, macho, macho man. Yeah. Versus the reaper people have to investigate and Use see their the magic tether. Use their abilities. And, yeah, I wanted to know a lot more about reapers. Yes, but they seriously play like almost zero role in the story yeah which is too bad other than the first chapter yeah um because let me ask you this what is the difference between ren and julian when it comes to fighting ghosts nothing well i guess ren can use bone magic but sure but does that help her fight ghosts not really i mean well i guess i would say it does because the bones can repel the ghosts to some degree but even uh-huh. that gets changed in the haunted territory. They're less reactive. Or they're more, um, they're more, oh my god, what's the word? <laughs> when something becomes resistant. Oh, resistant. yeah. They're yeah. more resistant to bones, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Because they're both, both Julian and Ren are like tanks, yeah. basically, which well, isn't as interesting. I don't know. Here, here's what I'll say. The difference between Ren and Julian, when it comes to fighting ghosts mm-hmm. specifically, is Ren's accessories. <laughs> yeah, she's like, I look cool. Yeah, well, she could literally give all of her weapons over to Julian, and he's just as capable a fighter as she is, uh-huh. and he could become a Valkyr, right? Does he need magic to fight ghosts? Yes. Does he need bone magic to fight ghosts? I think so. Okay, That was How? my understanding. Because... I didn't see how her magic was used to fight ghosts. Okay. Other than being able to sense them and being like, there's a ghost within 10 feet of us. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I feel like, I feel like Julian was definitely more afraid of all the ghosts and she wasn't, which is, you know. Sure. She has more experience with them. She knows how to fight them and she's trained for so long, but. That's all training that anyone could do, I guess. I mean, yeah. maybe there's like... She's a good fighter against ghosts. Yeah. But how is that fighting specifically different from Julian's? Yeah. Because a ghost doesn't even fight back, really, except it tries to touch you. 
And if a ghost touches you, you die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get frostbite. Ghost frostbite. <laughs> sure, depending on how powerful the ghost yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. You get a frostbite, or if it passes cold. through you, you get death rot, and then you die. Yeah. Um, Your body gets frostbite, and you shrivel up like a plum. Yeah. Do yeah. plums shrivel? Like a raisin. Yeah. Yes. That's a better simile. I think you can dry, think you can dry plums, but raisin sure. is the one that people think of, though. <laughs> you shrivel up like an apple. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like... I feel like... The... I see what you're saying. Yeah. There's not... It's not like, oh, she used her bone magic to dispel Repel the ghost. ghost. Yeah. yeah, we don't see that. But a reaper could, yeah. which is why they're more interesting to me. Yeah. So because like, a reaper could find a skeleton, use their magic to see the ley lines, is what they say. Yeah. The ley lines in the bone, look for the anchor bone, which is where the ghost is located, and, and then sever. sever it. Yeah. That's more interesting. That requires a specialization yeah. that no one else has. Yeah. Right? You need the bone magic to see those ley lines. Yeah. And how, how much more interesting would it be if she's like, hey, Julian, you got to... You have to you defend have to me from me. the ghosts. Here, take my chest plate. Or yeah. here, take my pauldrons. Take my swords. Yeah, I gotta go figure this out. You have like, to hold the ghost back. Yeah. That, even though you've never fought a ghost that before. That would have been a lot more interesting. I know, yeah. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not shitty on the book, I'm not shitty on the book. But those that's things, okay. I think, could have been so much better. Yeah, yeah. And it would have been interesting, that. even if Ren didn't have any Reaper training, where it's like, she had we're to passing it out through, or... yeah. We're passing through the hunted territory. I have to learn how to be a reaper on the fly. Yeah. And that's how good she is, that she can train herself to become a reaper. Mm -hmm. Like, against tier 5 revenants, the most powerful ghosts. We don't even get any training against these ghosts because we have this big uh, bone wall that keeps them out. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, tier 5 ghosts are more myth than reality. Yeah. Like, that's how scary and dangerous these things are. Yeah. That... And I've learned how to become a reaper, like, even against those terrifying ghosts like there's new rules that we couldn't anticipate yeah like none of that comes into play yeah i think that would which been is more interesting there's even a part in the story i'm sorry to bring this up <laughs> <laughs> but it happens in the book you can read it for yourself when ren gives julian one of her blades to fight against the ghosts uh -huh. and she tells him that you're basically a valkyrie already yeah because you just need a bone blade to fight against ghosts yeah i wish there would have been more for the bone magic to do like, yeah. like it has to be a requirement otherwise like you said anybody could do it if they have the right yeah. weapons or you could just give armor. like a guard who's holding a spear a put bone a bone spear? tip on the end of it yeah and now you're a valkyr yeah that's kind of lame it is lame if there was like a bit more specialization for her mm -hmm. magic specifically that would have made her feel so much more unique yeah yeah and um, and like it's kind of which sad is too that, bad yeah it's sad that the most interesting i thought reapers were way more interesting than valkyrs and i was like okay and they don't show up at all no no it's I, too bad yeah i wish there was more yeah um i have one other thing to say about the world building too okay and this is me comparing it to other things that i've read mm -hmm. so it's not that big of a knock on the story in and of itself if you did enjoy the world building yeah. because it's it might be the first time you've read um, a story with a similar tone yeah. and similar world to this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the ghosts are kind of boring. They can't really do anything. Tell me what the difference between a tier one and a tier two ghost is. They're just more angry. <laughs> you know, that's like, kind of unfortunate, well, right? I, I did, I did enjoy the. Sorry, my chair is so squeaky. Squeaky old chair. Um, I did enjoy revenants that could lift their own bones and their own bodies that yeah. was really interesting but i wanted more of that and more differences between me the too because like it was it was it kind of to me seemed like either regular ghost or zombie or you're ghost. A yeah yeah yes exactly which i mean you could have just done those two and just done those two yeah but being that there were supposed to be five different distinct tiers and we didn't really see the differences between those mm -hmm. it's kind of a wasted opportunity yeah you could have clumped tiers one through four into the same thing. Yep. And say there's ghosts. And there's revenants. And then there's revenants. Yeah. It would have simplified your world building and made it better. Yeah. Because when she's like, ooh, this might be a tier three ghost. I'm like, I don't know how that's more dangerous than a tier one. Yeah, you're like, other than the, the number is higher. Yeah. Um, so I think what you could have done was say, 
get rid of the tier system mm -hmm. and just say there's some ghosts that can haunt objects. Yeah. Those are called poltergeists. Yeah. And then there's some ghosts that are like malevolent spirits. They're like brides who were their husbands were killed or whatever and now they're like extremely powerful because they're so depressed yeah 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 <laughs> I don't know. oh yeah you know? and this and that type of ghost it has like long claws and they can like cut through bone armor yeah right like give these ghosts something unique to mm -hmm. make them feel more different yeah get rid of the tier system because it makes your world feel so much more narrow yeah i agree and also like the tier system seems like a very lateral way of looking yeah. at it like any ghost can be a tier one any yeah. ghost can be a tier two versus if it was like ghosts poltergeist revenants there could be i don't know that sounds so much more specific so much more interesting mm -hmm. and for them to have unique powers or magic depending on their backstory yeah that's so much more unique and that would actually solve your problem with ren not having enough of a specialization to distinguish her yes. apart from regular people yeah because now valkyrs oh i have to learn how to deal with poltergeists mm -hmm. well how do i do that well you need this type of potion and you need to gather yeah. these rare materials and you have to brew it in a specific way yeah or if you're going to deal with this other type of malevolent spirit you need to learn more about the history of the person mm -hmm. and like find the skeleton and they might have like a bracelet that was really important to them yeah. you have to destroy that bracelet along with the anchor bone mm -hmm. you know that's stuff that julian can't just pick up on the fly yeah but ren would need years of training and experience to learn how to handle mm -hmm. so this is where um me liking really boring epic fantasy comes <laughs> into play yeah because stuff like the witcher does such a good job uh -huh. of that um, and I haven't read the books, but I played the game Witcher 3. <laughs> I love Witcher 3. Um, that's what the Witcher does so well. It, uh -huh. it leans on those like rich occult folklore okay. monsters, yeah, like hags and yeah. werewolves and, you know, stuff that's specific to the region where that story was written, which uh -huh. is Poland, I uh -huh. think. Like, why don't you draw yeah, on some of those so monsters to make your world feel more enticing and mysterious mm -hmm. not only does it make your world feel like oh anywhere i go i could run into some monster that i've never even heard of before yeah but it also makes your main character feel like such a badass yeah to be able to change on the fly and go okay well i have done experience in this mm -hmm. in my academy for four years and now i need to throw all of that out the window and figure this out yeah you know like that's so much more interesting to read and to go through like i love when you're reading and you're processing with the character mm -hmm. to be like oh okay yeah that makes sense or, how do i approach this problem yeah exactly exactly yeah. because whenever ren fights a ghost it's like oh i know how she wins yeah. she just hits it with a bone sword yeah or throws some bone dust yeah. at it yeah it's very then, formulaic <laughs> sorry but there is one moment when ren puts some bone dust on the ground uh -huh. to keep some revenants at bay <laughs> and then julian calls her a genius <laughs> It's I'm sorry. Just, it's it was just so funny when it's like, wouldn't that be kind of like a normal logical conclusion? Yeah. Where it's like she sees well, him put some bone dust on the ground, which is cool. What do people do for ghosts? They put salt in a ring around yeah. them to protect themselves, or you know. That's almost like common cultural knowledge you can draw upon. Yeah. It doesn't feel that genius to do. It almost yeah. felt like he was trying to like, you know make her like him which maybe yeah. that's the reason why he said that that was a genius uh -huh. but it didn't really feel that genius to me <laughs> yeah. like like i don't know yeah that's a good point i'm sorry i keep on feeling like i'm making this book feel like you don't like it anymore no i still like it good i did too once again i keep on qualifying this thing and it's probably getting <laughs> annoying but you know you can look past the world building and still enjoy a story mm -hmm. Like I said, the re the adventure of saving Leo and uh, Ren's reasons for why she's doing that is all good. Mm -hmm. The relationship between her and Julian, I liked. Mm -hmm. And it had a good sense of progression. Yeah. Um, all that stuff is good. And the world building you can still enjoy. Mm -hmm. I'm just comparing it to... I'm comparing it to The Witcher. Yeah, and I've never read that. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. That but The Witcher really is cool. regarded as a really unique, well crafted world. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, this does not rank up there in terms yeah. of quality. Yeah. But it's still good. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really excited for you to read something like 
getting the knight to see how they do their world building mm-hmm. because it is much more similar to Bonesmith where mm-hmm. it's based on necromancy. Yeah. They even have like, um, I don't know how you describe it, the, the Valkyrie Reaper pair. Mm-hmm. They have a similar thing in getting the knight uh-huh. where it's a necromancer is paired with a cavalier. Okay. And the cavalier is a fighter, but they don't have any necromancy. Mm. But the necromancy is, necromancer is like just a, a magician with no combat skills. Okay, that's interesting. That's a good. That's that's a good yeah. example of pairing up two separate and unique identities yes. that need each other to accomplish a similar goal. Yeah, which is why Valkyrs and Reapers are inherently interesting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But then they take that away so early. Yeah, I'm. I'm hoping. I don't know. I hope we get it in the second book. I guess. But I don't know <laughs> if they will. Me either. If we haven't for the whole. Yeah. <laughs> thing, but. Because. While um, Ren's Bonesmith abilities are not that interesting, mm-hmm. she does learn that she has some other magical abilities by the end of the book while she's traveling to the Breachlands. And that is interesting. Yes. Yeah. So we should talk about that. Yeah. So when she gets into the Breachlands, she finds out that some of the remnants and the ghosts can communicate with her, which ghosts can't talk. In, mm-hmm. this, in the world that she knows, they can't talk, they can't communicate. They aren't even thought to really be sentient that much, Mm -hmm. other than they are attracted to life, and so they want to take your life. Like, Mm -hmm. it's like this very rudimentary goal of the ghosts. And then while she's there, she starts hearing them in her head and talking back to them, and she's kind of like, my whole world is different than what I thought it was, which was Mm -hmm. really unique and interesting. And she even finds that she can correct me if i'm wrong but there's moments where she tells the ghost to stop and they obey her right? yeah that's later on in yeah. the story but yes but it's interesting to be with her as she's trying to find out like why is it different mm-hmm. what like what is happening for yeah so that is one element of the world building that i do like and think is good um most stories focus on one world building mystery mm-hmm. that i've found at least in my experience and that's um, a really engaging part of the story that keeps you reading. Mm-hmm. And as Ren and Julian travel closer through to the breach itself, mm-hmm. um, we learn more about Ren's mysterious ghost powers. Yes. Um, and about the um, the revenants and the ghosts themselves and how they're able to talk. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to talk about that. Because there is one it's... thing that I do want to bring up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think we might just have to skip that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But maybe not. Because it's just sort of similar related to my other comments about how the ghosts aren't that interesting. Uh-huh. Because there is one moment when Ren and Julian are fighting against a bunch of revenants. Mm-hmm. And they're just mirroring her movements. So Ren and Julian are traveling through the woods... Mm-hmm. And then they get surrounded by, like, several revenants. Do yeah. you remember this? This is kind of yes. early on. Yes. And she's moving and watching them, and they're kind of, like, mirroring her movements. And then she turns around because Julian is like, we need to get the hell out of here. We're surrounded by Tier 5 ghosts. These are the most dangerous ghosts uh-huh. ever. We're going to die. Yeah. Who knows what these things are capable of? They're like zombie ghosts. Uh-huh. They turn around, and there's, like, this little girl revenant ghost. Mm-hmm. And she tells the both of them to go, to turn around and leave. Mm-hmm. Like, the ghosts aren't intentionally attacking them. It's more like they're guarding their ter- territory, trying yeah. not to kill people. Yeah. Which is unusual. Almost like they're being controlled by someone. Yeah. Um, and Ren and Julian run away, but not after one of the ghosts attacks Julian mm-hmm. and makes his hand turn into, like, frostbite, ice, whatever. Yes. Yes. So, Ren and Julian... <laughs> escape the tier five revenants and luckily because they're tier five ghosts they have zombie parts they have, they have parts of the body attached to them so they move more slowly mm-hmm. um which is a shame because they're supposed to be tier five revenants and they're supposed to be super powerful so yeah. the way that they outwit these very powerful ghosts is by just running yeah I think <laughs> it's just that's, kind of unfortunate I think like logistically i understand why yeah. they would move slower if they're trying to hold up body weight rather than just their spirit Mm -hmm. form but if they can hold up the spirit form why can't they be fast with the spirit form too like if they're supposed to be the most powerful 
I don't see why that would prohibit them. Yeah. Maybe, I guess. There are like small things like that with the rules of like how the ghosts work mm -hmm. that we don't really have answers to. Yeah. And so it kind of makes the action scenes and the plot not that interesting mm -hmm. or kind of hard to understand because the way that Ren and Julian just defeat these tier five revenants is by running away. Yeah. Which is like, it's like eh, okay, it's kind well, of a shame. Anybody could have done that. Yeah. Right. Versus, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Because really, in the story, that's the only time that they fight Revenants. There is another time. Yeah. Later on. But uh -huh. that's not until after Ren gets her ghost powers. Yeah, and she's like, oh, oh. I can tell ghosts what to do. Yeah. So whenever they face, they never fight Tier 5 Revenants, really. Yeah. So that's kind of a problem for me <laughs> yeah it's not super interesting like why set up this great powerful thing and then never touch it yeah like we want to see that conflict we want to see how they would deal with it yeah it would have been so much more interesting if friends like i think i can be a reaper and kill these tier five ghosts yeah but that... julian you have to fight them off for me yeah that would have been, that been great cool. right <laughs> yeah instead she throws some bone dust and runs away uh-huh and then they climb up this old wash tower, mm -hmm. and then she watches one of them start to climb a ladder, and she's like, ghosts aren't supposed to be thinking like that. Yeah. So she cuts down the ladder, and then the ghosts just leave. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Like, it's like, you're watching Ren try to puzzle this together, but then you're also like, wait, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you're also in that confused state, even if... Like, you're waiting like too for, much. There's yeah. too much confusion. Yeah, you're waiting for the threat of these ghosts to reveal itself. Yeah, like go get a hammer. I mean, an axe. Start chopping down the tree. Yeah. Versus just waiting them out in a treehouse. Yeah, exactly. They're they're not threatening enough. Mm -hmm. Um, what's scary about zombies is that they travel in hordes. Yeah. And like, if they see you like hold up in a treehouse, they'll wait below you. Yeah. For you to come back down. Yeah. Because they're desperate for brains. But these ghosts... They're like, too much work. Yeah. Phone it in. <laughs> Even though there's, there's like... At home. There isn't a living thing within miles. Except yeah. for right here. But we don't really want to eat you that bad. Yeah, here. I think that could have been more interesting. Like, the the fact that, all, that ghosts are attracted to living things... It would have been fun if maybe it started out as one following them mm -hmm. and then more and more gathered and more and more gathered until they were in the middle of a horde yeah. and tried to figure out how the hell do we get out of this situation yeah. or something like that yeah i agree it could have it just kind of dissolves all the you know conflict from ghosts yeah it makes them feel like not powerful at all yeah like they're not difficult to deal with you can just outrun them yeah or you can climb up a tree or you can like Go live on an island somewhere. Yeah, where there's because, no ghosts on the island. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we forgot to mention this. By the way, ghosts can't travel on or through water. Oh, yeah. I forgot that. Which is kind of a strange rule. Yeah. I don't know what the significance is. I also don't that. know how that works. Because if ghosts can hover, why can't they hover over water? Yeah. I don't understand. It's a little unclear. Yeah. But in general, they can't. Yeah, and they like move slower water. in the rain too, right? Yeah. So it's like, a little bit like it could weird. I'm okay with there being rules. Yeah, I just want to know why or see them used more. Like, yeah. oh, bone dust and a squirt gun combo. Yeah, why don't you just invent squirt guns? Why don't you just carry around with you pails of water? <laughs> yeah. If you have, that would have been interesting. Uh huh. Let's say they're like, um, how do I deal with these ghosts? They're attacking me. I have some water in my water skin. We're trying to survive in the woods. We only have so much left. You got to choose between. I could squirt someone a ghost. Yeah. yeah. Well, now the immediate threat is gone, but now you need to find water. And there yeah. isn't any in the haunted territory for miles. Yeah, that would have been interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, let's stop shitting on the book. Because I feel like I keep shitting on the book and it's making you hate me. <laughs> no! I don't hate you. Okay. Not for that reason. You can say that. Just kidding. <laughs> but it's a matter of me believing it. I'm sorry. Um, I believe it. Okay. Um, <laughs> this we is now a about... sibling therapy session. Yes. Just kidding. Let's talk about the virtues of this book. Yes. Um, Ren and Julian travel to the Breachlands. They find the Ghost Smith Village. Mm -hmm. um, and how they end up there is because they want to take another shortcut through the haunted territory, which is this old bridge Ripping made of iron. Bridge. Mm -hmm. And this is a cool setting piece, too. Um, 
And they're like, maybe we can cross this bridge, even though it's ancient and falling apart. It's a huge risk, but we have to take it because we need to save Leo in mm -hmm. time. And all this time they're falling in love, right? Yes. Slow burn, forced proximity. Yeah. Do you have anything to say about that? I, I... Because <laughs> I don't know what I could say. I just like... Okay, here, here's a specific moment. Uh -huh. After the Julian and Ren face those first tier five revenants, they go climb up the watchtower, cut off the ladder, and the ghosts leave. Mm -hmm. um, Julian, he was touched by a ghost, and his hand is freezing. Mm -hmm. And she's like, the only way, the only way to heal you. We have to take both our clothes off. Yep, they're like, they're <laughs> like, have to frostbite up. rules, come here, baby. <laughs> yep, I know that we're best friends. Yeah. But the only way to overcome this. I, I feel like. Is I have to sneak sleep. I have to get into the sleeping bag with you. Um, I will say, you definitely have not read <laughs> YA fantasy. I know, I haven't. I don't have <laughs> because, a problem with it. Really because, don't. like, people who read that for the YA fantasy would be like, <gasps> I know. Oh my gosh. No, I get that. Yeah. On a logical level, I understand the appeal. <laughs> <laughs> it, I definitely was like, okay, things are cooking. Yeah. Things are cooking. The relationship is progressing. Yeah. It's fun to have Julian be wounded and injured and Ren has to use her knowledge and expertise uh -huh. to help him. Yes. And she's like, well, I don't really hate that I'm in this situation. Yes. She's right. like, okay, okay. Yeah. Um. Also, Julian has a thing with his gloves. He doesn't like to take his gloves off. That's yes. important later. Um, He's very self-conscious about he, his hands. Yes. He got Donald Trump hands. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, he wears gloves and there's gloves like iron inside them to make his hands look bigger. Yeah. That's why he's not very good with a sword. He's so clumsy. Um, I don't want you to see how small my hands are. He's like, no, no. <laughs> She's like, I had to take your gloves off. He's like, please, no. I would rather die. Chop I would off rather the die. hand. Yeah. Burn it. I'd rather lose this arm. Yeah. Um. I think I think the romance in this book is good. I enjoyed it. Okay. It's definitely. Like I said, I thought that was one of the better parts of the book. Yeah. Yeah. I liked it. I liked the banter between the two of them. They yeah. Definitely fight a lot, which is fun. Yeah. To read. It's fun. And like being that they're forced to be together is that's a huge trope for a lot of people. Forced proximity. Um, it makes sense. Yeah. It works. Yeah. And, and like, it's fun to see the challenges they have to overcome because they're like, well, we have to sleep together. Yeah. But it, it is the silly little... It is tropey. Oh, so cold. I need you to <laughs> warm me up in my sleeping yeah, bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I'll take my shirt off. Yeah, it's definitely... <laughs> We can see what's happening. It's a little cringy, but it makes sense. I know what's in the book and it works. Yes, yes. It's we, it's funny to talk about it out loud. Yeah. You're like... Mm -hmm. It is. But when you're reading it, it's entertaining. Yeah, yeah. And the relationship does progress naturally. Yeah. It doesn't feel forced. Julian is hurt and he does need to be warmed up to yes. be brought back to life. It does feel like they kind of crashed into this world to write this armpit. moment. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah, he would just be like, just put your arm in your armpit, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. I don't need to cuddle up with you, but apparently she But did. when I'm asleep, no. Yeah. Um, I'm okay with all of that. Um, it's not really why I like to read books. Yeah. Obviously. I, I, I've kind of torn into the reasons why I don't like this book. Yes. Um, and those are the books that I like. Yeah. I like romance in my fantasy books. Yeah. Um, I'm not averse to it. Yeah, me either. I, I, but I don't want to read a fantasy book where romance is the main plot yeah i don't I, that's not my favorite thing yeah this isn't a romance book yeah but it is a big part of it yeah yeah for sure um i liked how the how the relationship progressed i like when you can i i just love enemies to lovers i think it's fun mm -hmm. to watch you'll like getting the two the people yeah it's another similarity good I, I like watching two people's relationship go from I hate you, I want to kill you, too. I would kill anybody for you. Like, yeah. I think that's fun. There's a reason why people like it so much. Yes. Um, and I think that she did that very well, especially being that a lot of the times when they would get close, Ren's first thought would be, he's going to betray me. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, they still kept that at the front, mm -hmm. which was good, because I don't want that to be ignored. Um, that's important, right? Yeah. Because... A relationship that goes from we're really good friends to now we're lovers is not as big of a jump from we're moral enemies to we're lovers. Yes. 
and even still when they do get to lovers they're like you're yeah. still gonna betray me at the end of this. they still don't know each other that yeah. well yeah exactly and like yes so they are cuddling and they heal up yeah. And they keep on traveling through the breach lands mm-hmm. to reach this bridge. Yes. This is my favorite part in the whole book, I think. Mine too. Well, no, that. my favorite part was the ending. But this is a good moment. That's a good... Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. The ending is really strong. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a, one of the better moments in the story, though, too. Mm-hmm. It comes second in my heart. Yes. The bridge. <clears throat> um, so they reach the bridge, and there's, like, this old decrepit city that's surrounding it. Apparently, the breach was, uh, before the breach happened, there was, like, this normal city, I yeah. guess, that was part of the Iron Citadel, mm-hmm. I'm assuming. I think so. I think that's that's what I understood it as. Okay. So, it's a cool setting. Yeah. Once again, it's very haunted. Just like, and a, just like a ghost town. Yeah, it's like a ghost. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it is. It's wow, a ghost town. it is a ghost town. <laughs> um, and they find a bunch of revenants there. Mm-hmm. And they're standing in front of the bridge and telling him, go back, go back. Mm-hmm. Um, for one moment, to play devil's advocate, mm-hmm. maybe the reason why the revenants aren't that threatening is because they are being controlled. We assume at this point in the story that they're being controlled by someone and they don't want to harm Ren or Julian. That is a good point. That could be an explanation. Yeah. But I also see how that could be used as an a excuse. Cop out. Yeah. Kind of a cop out to make to not worry about like making the revenants more threatening. Yeah. Because it's harder to write plot where it's like, how do I make these characters overcome this yeah. impossible obstacle? That's a good point. But hmm. we'll just shelf that for later. Yeah. It's just yeah. a thought. <laughs> um I do feel like they do a good job with overcoming this obstacle, though, by thinking creatively and using the abilities of these characters that set them apart from the rest of the world. Yes. So, do you want to explain it? Because you said you, it's, it's one of your favorite parts in the book. I, I just, so they're trying to cross this bridge, and as they're crossing, but they can't the, cross it the because the revenants are, are on the other side. Yeah. And then it starts to way. rain. Does it, isn't it raining? It rains, yes, but not until they reach halfway. Okay. Okay. At first, the revenants are just blocking their way to the, their entrance to the bridge, mm-hmm. so they have to go around to the side. Okay, okay. And then Julian pulls out his whip sword, and he's like, okay, hold on to me, sweetie. <laughs> and he whips out his sword and uh-huh. uses his magic, and they swing, it latches onto a part of the bridge, and they use it to swing across to another Yeah, connection. which I thought was really interesting. That was cool. And I was so happy to see the whip being used again, because yeah. I think that's such a cool weapon design. I agree. And it's some kind of a specialization. Only an Ironsmith can mm-hmm. use it because he uses his magic to control the whip mm-hmm. to like its trajectory, and he uses it to make the links stay together. Yeah. And that all that stuff is cool. Mm-hmm. So I wish they did that with Ren. <laughs> I know. It, it, even still, she's like. <sighs> yeah, she just she loves her bone best. Yeah, she does. Which also. How much did she have? That's something that I, I kept know. on asking. I was like, is this regenerating? Oh, she does make more. Doesn't she, she make does. more? I think she, well, she keeps mentioning that they, they find like a mausoleum. Oh, there is an important character moment here before they enter the bridge too. Oh, yeah. Um, she mentions that she finds a mausoleum and she collects some bones and some bone dust and mm-hmm. stuff. Um, which, that moment made me pause to think, why doesn't she just, like, give Julian a femur to fight out against both right? ghosts just... with? Because <gasps> he has a club. Yeah. She doesn't even have to give him her own weapons. No. Anyway. Um, there's part of Julian's character. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess we should briefly talk about how well the characters were written. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> because I think that is a positive in the story. I do think the characters are well written. They uh-huh. each have motivations. And they have reasons for why they want the things that they want. Mm-hmm. And they're both filled with trauma. Yeah. All that stuff is good for a character. Yeah. You want your characters to be very depressed. Yes. In order for your story to be interesting. Yeah, we need growth. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yes, exactly. Uh-huh. Um, and part of Julian's trauma is that his father died during mm-hmm. the Breach Wars. Yeah. So that's another thing that pits them against each other because her uncle killed him was the murderer yeah but she doesn't tell him that yeah and so it's like oh and as they become closer friends that's a greater point of tension within ren's mind where she's keeping her identity yeah from him yeah she's a graven lock Mm -hmm. he's 
the person who mass murdered your entire people, including yeah. your father. Yeah, but she's like, I'll just keep that to myself, which yeah. I like. That's interesting. Yes, that tension's good. Mm -hmm. Um, and Julian is also royalty. Yeah, and he's, he's the not heir saying that either. Mm -hmm. He does tell him that eventually. But yeah, but it takes a while. So both of them are yeah. being secretive about it. Yes, and they're and outside of their identities, they are beginning to like each other very mm -hmm. much. So mm -hmm. that becomes more complex. Yeah. Um, but which is, like I said, the best part of the book and why yeah. I kept reading. Um, and part of the reason why Julian is, I think, in my mind, although this isn't mentioned, why he wants to explore the haunted land is because he wants to find evidence of his father's death. I think the same thing. I definitely... He wants some closure. Yeah, yeah I agree. And I think maybe that's part of why... Maybe he also wants run around. He's mm -hmm. like, oh, if I can find my dad's ghost. She can put him to rest. Yeah. Why not say that, though? That would have been it, such a it, great moment. That That's another, like, I think that was definitely implied. Okay. But. I would love if they had actually I want them to say it. it. What a good moment for him to be like. I want her to, to be like, what are you ghost. looking for out here? Like, we're trying yeah. to get away from these ghosts. And he's like, I'm looking for my dad. And yeah. I want you to make sure that he's put to rest. Like, what yeah. a. I, I see what you're saying. I think I'm wrong. I think it is implied. Uh -huh. And that scene does exist. Yeah. Where she does symbolically put his father's yeah. soul to rest. When they find this mass grave, mm -hmm. all these ghosts are just wandering around aimlessly. They're the souls of both members of the House of Bone and the Iron Citadel, mm -hmm. which makes Ren wonder why this story of uh, Locke saving everyone um, might not be as true as she thought. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Julian is kind of looking through this mass grave for evidence of his father's banner or his body or something, yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. And she notices that and says, we need to move on. Mm -hmm. I know this is important to you. Um, but what, what I can do is like set up a temporary grave. Yeah. And, and that was touching. It was touching. It was a great moment. Yeah. Really. Um, and I'm sorry, I feel like I'm not giving the story enough credit. <laughs> But you're those fine. are good moments. It almost yeah. feels like I'm like trying to look for holes and everything. No, you're fine. Um, there are really great moments. Mm -hmm. And that part of the story did make me feel emotional. Yeah. It was really sweet, really touching when she made this temporary grave. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Julian said any I words. Think, I don't think so, but I think she did the like right. the rights. Yeah. yeah. Um, all that stuff was great. Mm -hmm. And then they could both move on and try to get across this bridge yes yes so these character moments are really important to bring up i don't want to just rush through them yeah um but yeah that was probably th that's just to say that there is our moments of character connection and growth mm -hmm. between these two yeah and that, that don't have to do with combat or saving yeah. the prince and they are meaningful yeah and they're well written too mm -hmm. um it would be so much worse if Julie was like, my dad died. I need you to put us all to rest if you just said it directly, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. so much better to show that scene mm -hmm. and to put us in Ren's mind and she's making these observations like, oh, he's looking for his dad. Mm -hmm. I know how I can help. I like Julian. Yeah. Um, let's perform this right. Yeah. For him. Taking time out of their adventure to take care of his emotions. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I like that. And it's a, it's a great moment between the two of them where they both, are setting aside their goals mm -hmm. and and their differences and their differences and to be like you're a person I care about yeah let me do this thing for you mm -hmm. that means nothing you she know, has like no stake in it yeah yeah she's like I don't have to do this mm -hmm. I would like to do this to you so that you can feel better you yeah. know like it, it's very nice it is um, and if anything for Julian it just shows him that she does care about him yeah as a person yeah. Which is great. Mm -hmm. It's a well done scene. Mm -hmm. Really important in the story. Yeah. Um. Anyway, back to the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> they swing across the bridge. Um, Tarzan and Jane. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Just three. Um, and things don't go according to plan. Obviously, that's what makes a good action scene. Mm -hmm. So when you come up with a plan, but then things don't go accordingly, and you have to improvise. Mm -hmm. So the revenants start following them from the side of the bridge that they started on, and then they look on the other side of the bridge, and there's more revenants. Because, of course, they're in the middle of the breach. Yeah. Like, did they not think that they're going to be surrounded they're by like, revenants? They're like, oh, they're just on this side. Yeah, I can take care of them. <laughs> well, you haven't proven that you are capable of that yet. Yes. So you've kind of set yourself up for failure. <laughs> Ren sprinkles some bone dust on the bridge, 
And Julian says, you're a fucking genius. <laughs> and then it starts to rain. And then he's like, I didn't think you were that smart anymore. You're like, the bomb dust is disappearing. Yeah. 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 And so the revenants keep closing in on them. And then um, Julian is trying to keep the ghosts at bay. Or he's like setting up for another whip shot. Yeah. When Ren falls through the bridge. Mm -hmm. And he catches her with his whip. Mm -hmm. And then he's trying to pull her back up. But he's and being she's like, by she's like, whoa, he's really strong. He's like stronger than strong. a normal man. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> um, she falls uh, into the crevice mm -hmm. because she thinks she sees water underneath. Or she can hear I water underneath. I think so. I still thought that was interesting. I thought the crevice was so I, yeah. deep. I was like, I thought she would still get injured from falling yeah. at that height. Which. You would, but whatever. Anyway. We can look past it. All of it's fantasy. There's no yeah. ghosts. There's yeah. no rules. Anyway, um, she falls into the crevice and lands safely in some water. And loses her bag. And she might have had a concussion. Yes. Yes. And she loses one of her swords. I think so. So she's like. Wandering in this water, which is surprisingly warm. Mm -hmm. It's a spring. It's like a hot spring kind of thing. And she's like trying to figure out if she can get out. And she's like, well, I'm dead. Julian's going to mm -hmm. go on with his quest. Why would he come and save me? On either side of the bank, there's revenants surrounding her. So she's like, but I got to But they can't cross water, so yeah. she can stay in the water. Yeah, she's like, I got to stay in the water, so good thing it's warm. Yeah. And then she finds a shack. Not before that. Julian splashes into the water behind That's her. right! I couldn't remember how fast he comes in. Of course. And then they travel together to find the shack. And she's mm -hmm. like delirious and dazed. She's like, I live where I am. I hit my head. Uh -huh. Julian's like, we gotta get you to someplace warm quickly. So they find a shack. Luckily the shack is in the middle of the water so the revenants can't touch them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we have another forced proximity. Is that what you yes. call it? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, this whole thing is forced proximity. Yeah, it is. But this is special. But this is like intimate forced yes. proximity. Yes. So, um, basically, they're both wet and it's cold. Yeah. And Ren has to take all of her clothes off and wrap <laughs> herself around in one up. of Julian's blankets. <laughs> yeah. Um, they've also lost half of their supplies, mm -hmm. which I think is fun and interesting. Um. And she has a concussion, question mark, but then she feels better after. Yeah, she heals. She sleeps. She takes a nap. Which, I don't know, seems like there's a lot of injuries. They don't that copulate here. or anything at this moment. And No. But she is naked under some blankets. Yes. And Julian is nearby. Yeah. And then she sees his bare feet in the fire. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, that turned me off. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So it's really hot and heavy in this little yes, shack. Yes, yes. With the fire roaring. And the rain the, falling. Yep. And the, the ghosts. Hot springs. A watching. <laughs> all these sicko pervert ghosts. <sighs> anyway, I don't really remember what happens next. That leads to them basically trying to thug in the spring. Yeah, they definitely make out. Yes. But Ren says something like, do you need me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or Julian tells her that I need you. Yes. It's like a... Yeah. It's another romance I don't know. Scene. It's another romance trope, too. To be yes. like, be like, this guy who doesn't ever need anything. And then being like... Okay, I do. I'm vulnerable now. Yeah, yeah, You've yeah. you changed me. And we do get a couple of chapters from Julian's perspective. Oh, yeah, that's in right. In there, here and there, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, I like those, too. Yeah, I, I enjoyed them. I I love multiple POVs. I really oh. enjoy that. Okay, I didn't this, know that. This isn't, like... I do, too. Yeah, this and this isn't split evenly. No. We get, like, maybe five chapters throughout the book from Julian. Yeah. And one... It might be more like three, and then two from Leo. Oh, that's right. We do get a couple <laughs> from Leo, huh? I totally forgot. Yeah, but you could have taken those out. Yeah, yeah. Um, but more on that later. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's fun to see Julian's perspective in this because he definitely has feelings for her before she does, I think. Mm -hmm. And they're, he's more aware of them yeah. than she is. She's kind of like, man, this guy hates me. She's, he's hot, but he hates me. Yeah, she's more invested in saving Leo. Yeah, sure. and he's like... <laughs> he's totally entranced by Yeah, her. yeah, totally likes her, even though he knows he shouldn't, mm -hmm. which is a fun perspective to get. Um... I think they basically fall in love in this moment because um, 
Ren is like, why did you come back to save me? Yeah. And Julian says, because I need you. Which to, to her means more than just, I need your help fighting ghosts. Yeah. Because that's when they cross the bridge. I think that's when she gives him a bone blade that says, you're now an honorary Valkyrie. Yeah. So you really don't need my help to cross the haunted lands. You yeah. can have done it this entire time by yourself. Yeah. She doesn't actually say that. But, but that's how I, I interpreted mean, it. It's kind of, it's kind <laughs> of there. Like, her learning her new ghost powers makes her more valuable. Yes, it does. But yeah. she still doesn't know how to use them or know if it's real or mm -hmm. knows what they she are. She doesn't even. understand them at this point. Yeah. Um, so then when Julian says, I need you, he means I need you on an emotional level. Yes. And so that's why they fall in love. Yes. So um, they smooch in the hot springs. Yes. And it is detailed. Yeah. I haven't read a lot of YA fantasy. Bro, if you're going to read A Court of Thorns and Roses, <laughs> you better buckle okay. up. You better buckle up. This is mild. I, I didn't think. Mild. Okay, okay. I haven't read A Court of Thorns and Roses, all right? I don't know what to expect. <laughs> That's okay. You don't know until you read it. I don't look for fairy smut in my free time. <laughs> I have too many friends that read it. They yeah. pressured me into it. Uh -huh, Did I read sure. all 18 books? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, <laughs> you got peer pressured into reading 18 books. <laughs> it wasn't my own choice. No, nope. it's okay. I understand the appeal. Like I yeah. said, it's a good scene. It all makes sense. Mm -hmm. Character motivations, they all make sense. Yeah, I definitely liked it. It definitely made me giggle. Yeah, and I did want them to get together, honestly. Yeah. But what they do a good job of is... Um, while they're embracing each other, mm -hmm. Ren is feeling his big, muscular, strong arms. And she's like, whoa, that's a different material than skin. Yeah. It must be some sort of other type of inorganic material embedded yes. into his body. She doesn't say that. Yeah. But um, it makes Julian pull away from her. Mm -hmm. And he says, this has been a bad idea. Yeah. So then you do feel like, oh, that thing that I wanted for these two is taken away. Yeah. So I'm going to keep reading to see what happens because their relationship is evolving in a new and interesting direction. Mm -hmm. All that stuff is good. Yeah. And then, and I also think it's interesting, we get Ren's point of, point of view from that, and it's like, she feels super ashamed, which is interesting. Yeah. In this book, she's set up as a very irreverent individual who has sex often. Like, not really irreverent. 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 Like, yeah. like she is a sexual person. Not like the whole book is about that, but it's interesting to me to see how personally she takes that rejection mm -hmm. because she seems to flaunt a lot of stuff and not care. She so, says that this relationship with Julian is more than just a fling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it right. was interesting. She feels an emotional connection to him, mm -hmm. right, is what you're saying. Yeah. So when he rejects her, it genuinely hurts. Yes. And she blames herself. Yes. For it. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, that's something I would not have mentioned. <laughs> 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 but it's good because you want those relationships to change in unexpected ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Then they get dressed. Then they get dressed. <laughs> and they go on an adventure again. <laughs> they go back on their adventure. Um, they find, actually, while while Ren is in the spring, she sees that there's another human down in this ghost That's right. with them. With, like, an epic antler crown. Yeah. We didn't mention something from the very beginning that we should have. Yeah, in I know. the very first trial. I know, we forgot. Damn. Now we're just back to We're really it. bad at this. That's okay, it's our first episode. <laughs> it can't be perfect, right? Very, yes, it can. The very first, when she's doing that initial trial, she falls into a hole in the ground and finds a ring mm -hmm. with... A, she's betrayed by Inara. Yeah, she's betrayed she by She set Inara. a trap for her. Yeah. And she found a body in the bottom of this trap. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, you're fine. Go ahead. And on that body, she finds a ring that's like, has a metal spike through it. And it's like, I can't remember what material it is. Did they ever bone. say? Okay, it's a bone yeah, ring it's with a metal bone spike. Ring. Yeah, metal spike through the middle. And she holds on to it and doesn't tell anyone about yeah. it. She just is like... She tells Julian. Yeah. It's got weird glyphs she can't read. Mm -hmm. And it has um, two birds on it. Mm -hmm. And her name is Ren. And, and one of the birds is, is a Ren. Is a Ren. Yeah. She Didn't see that Julian, coming. <laughs> no, you didn't see that one coming from a mile away, did you? <laughs> um, actually, that's a good point. 
Did you did you anticipate Ren becoming a ghost? Spirit? Yes, very okay. early on. Good. Did you? No, but I'm dense. I I think in the story it's designed to to uh, make you think that she has ghost powers. Yes. Yeah. I I set out them pretty early on. I yeah. You have a knack for noticing those things. I, I'm pretty good at it. I also this is a book I'm more familiar with. Yeah. Like. You would see things in epic fantasy more than I would see things. Do you know what But I mean? those you fundamentals this... of storytelling are the same. Yeah. Really yeah. the difference is scope, largely, between this and something like The Way of Kings. Yeah. I'm pretty good at I'm pretty good at recognizing yeah. those patterns and guessing where it's gonna end up. I am not I am I, usually I'm along for it. the ride. I'm like, oh she found an interesting ring. That probably okay. won't, that's probably not a setup at all. It's just new jewelry. She's gonna find earrings next. Yeah. I was like, she leveled up. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, that, that is a good thing. It's a positive for the story. I'm stupid. And I would not have caught that she's like, oh, this ring is going to play into the story later on. <laughs> and I, I didn't until she finds this boy at the bottom of this mm-hmm. ghost village who can apparently control the remnants. And he has glowing eyes. And a ram's horn head. Yes. Helmet. Yeah. Oh, was it ram's crown. horn? I think they mentioned that it's like a ram. I imagine horns. they were antlers this whole time. Tell me why. I don't know. Because you're as dumb as I am. <laughs> yeah. You and I are dumb in different ways. Yeah. So we complement each other. True. We <laughs> make up for each other's lack of smartness. Um. So Julian and her follow him. Yes. But they're clothed at this point. There's they no put more on making their out. They're clothed. And Ren's like, hurry, hurry. There's another boy here. Yeah. So they're trying to figure this out. And the revenants are respecting him like they're following, they're following the boy. him but not menacing not they're responding to yes, him like yes. servants yeah yeah and they follow him into his temple yeah yeah and this whole ravine are there more houses in the ravine right that's what there's i picture like, there's like it's like yeah. a, mo- another layer of ghost town that's what i imagine yeah i i imagine that the ghost town was built underground a long time ago yes yeah that's what i imagine too okay so okay. all these houses belong to ghost smiths yeah but they're abandoned yeah and and there's a ghost smith temple there too yeah. at the bottom of this ravine and ghost smiths really are cool. another like magic race that have died out and no one yeah. knows about them because anyway. they're like there's they're taboo yeah they're taboo because they, they control the spirits of the dead and they there's rumors that some powerful ghostness could control spirits before they died mm-hmm. which i thought was very interesting yeah um i like i like that anyway they follow him into this temple mm-hmm. and then he's performing some sort of right right mm-hmm. and they're observing and then ren notices that he has another ring like hers on right well he julian and ren are spying on this boy Mm -hmm. who has a revenant um nearby him Mm -hmm. and they're both standing by this well of glowing water okay okay and it's been so long since i've read this no it's okay (laughs) no i'm trying not to talk so much but i know this is really fresh on my mind so yeah yeah you're good you're good um i'm just going to have to dominate the conversation that's okay that's okay so um Next to, iron, next to the Revenant is a suit of iron armor, mm-hmm. and it's totally different from Julian's. It looks like it's a newer model, perhaps, mm-hmm. or it comes from a different age, I think is what they say. They don't yeah. say a newer model. Um, but he reaches his hands into this pool, and this, the magic in, there's magic inside this pool. It's mm-hmm. a magical pool. It glows brighter and brighter, and it fills up his whole body. It fills up the horns on his head, on his crown. Mm-hmm. Horns, not antlers. Yes, Mallory. yes. <laughs> Um, I'm I'm fixing my picturing now. Yeah, and then the whole world shakes like an earthquake is about to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ren accidentally puts her hand on the ground and notices that some of the white magic flows up her arm too, mm-hmm. and she tries to pull it away but she can't. And then Julian pulls her arm off for her. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they watch the boy take his hands and put it into the revenant, I believe. Yeah. And the revenant walks into the armor. Was already so. wearing the armor. Somehow the revenant is wearing the iron armor, mm-hmm. and then the ghost tries to leave that revenant's body, but he takes an iron spike similar to the one on the ring, and knocks it into its head, and the ghost sticks back to the body. Yeah. Um, 
and then Ren and Julian are like, oh, that's freaking weird. Mm -hmm. This is way more important than what's happening with Leo. Yeah. Um, we gotta go leave and warn somebody mm -hmm. that there's like ghost smiths are still alive and that they're somehow working together with the iron smiths to make these iron revenants. Mm -hmm. But they get it to leave and Ren, this klutz, kicks a pebble. This idiot. This dumb this idiot. bitch. <laughs> and then the boy is like, there's intruders around them. Uh -huh. So Iron Revenant surround Julian and Ren. Mm -hmm. And the boy confronts Ren. Yeah. And she reaches into her pocket, pulls out this ring, and then he holds up his hand, and he's got a ring that's identical. Mm -hmm. An identical ring. Almost like they're identical twin rings. <laughs> Not that was people. dumb. I loved that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they're not related at all no. to each other. Who would guess that? Who yeah. would assume that? And Ren can speak to ghosts. I would Okay, at this point, I'm not so stupid that I didn't think, okay, they're twins. Yeah, okay, okay. I obviously made that connection while I was reading. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes, I'm pretty sure? sure. I have my notebook. I could pull out my <laughs> notebook and show you. I said, they're twins now. Yeah, there you go. Um. So Ren... And Julian leaves somehow. I don't know I how think, they leave. I think she tells the ghost to stop, and they listen to her, and they're ah, like... <laughs> that's right, yes. Ren has been, up until this point, noticing that she can communicate with ghosts, but I don't think she controls Yeah, I don't yet. think she's tried anything, but... Until now. She, she has conversation. She's, like, had a little bit of back and forth with him, but she hasn't ever been, like... Mm -hmm. Stop or do the hokey pokey. She hasn't or... used any <laughs> do the hokey pokey. To like <laughs> start doing the what's this one? Oh, the macarena. The macarena. <laughs> do the macarena. Um, It'll keep them busy for at least three minutes. Yeah, and then they'll have to slow walk to try and capture us. <laughs> Run away! <laughs> um, but at this point, she actually uses some kind of ghost myth abilities, uh -huh. and she thinks it's probably because she absorbs she absorbs some of the same power. Mm -hmm. She doesn't make the connection that she's like, oh, I'm a ghost smith. Yeah. She thinks the well just amplifies your powers. Yeah. And maybe she's like looking for any explanation other than that boy is my twin. Yeah. Uh, she also doesn't think that the ring is hers. She yeah. found it on someone else's body. So there's no reason for her to make that logical mm -hmm. connection she, maybe, anyway. Maybe she's like, oh, that dead body is this guy's twin. Yeah, or it belongs kidding. to him somehow. Yeah. Or that dead body, that person was a ghost smith. Mm -hmm. So that's all fine and makes sense. Um, they leave the breach. Mm -hmm. They climb back up the mine shaft that Julian took to uh, find Come her down. Mm -hmm. from the bridge. <clears throat> and then they have to formulate a new plan. They start running away from the revenants. Yeah. Like we have to get away from this boy who might be chasing us. He's mm -hmm. not. Thank goodness. That would make the story interesting. Yeah. He's um, like... Yeah. Bye, I'll let you go. Uh, <laughs> and then Julian and Ren have to reformulate their plans. Yeah. And they're like, are we going to go save Leo? Nope. No. Nope. <laughs> He's like, we got to tell someone about this weird thing that we didn't understand, yeah. nor should we really be concerned about, because he seems like he's just hanging out in the dark. Yeah. Well, there are reasons for why they should abandon their original quest. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of an interesting point. Um... Because they almost commit a grave sin of storytelling, in my opinion. Uh-huh. Uh, which is, at the beginning of your story, when you make a promise that the quest is going to be about, you know, like, in Lord of the Rings, we're going to put the ring into Mount Doom. Mm -hmm. At the three-quarter checkpoint of the story, you don't change that quest and do something else entirely. No. Right? That would no. feel so unsatisfying. Yeah. So up until this point... We've agreed that Julian and Ren are going to save Prince Leo. Mm -hmm. And they just, within one conversation, they don't even disagree yeah. with each other. They're like, let's work together to learn more about the Iron Revenants and give up yeah. on Leo entirely. Yeah, and they're, they're also, the ghosts also, when they have been talking to Ren, say some pretty cryptic stuff like, she's looking for you or yeah. we've been sent to for you. So, like, there's also that kind of aspect to it that, like, Maybe she has more personally invested in these revenants at this point than yeah than saving Leo. I don't know. It's it's such a weird turn. Yeah, it is to give up on Leo like yeah. that. 
even if like within this world if this were not a story and this were actually happening mm -hmm. Ren and Julian saw that Iron Revenant in the Ghost Smith and they're like this has greater implications on the fate of this world than rescuing Leo does yeah and it makes sense for us to give up on that smaller quest mm -hmm. in pursuit of this bigger one yeah because what does it mean that Iron Revenants that Iron Smiths are working together with Ghost Smiths mm -hmm. and Julian is royalty he's going to be heir to the iron citadel yeah and he doesn't know about this mm -mm. so whoever is an iron smith where he's from is obviously betraying him yeah so all those things make sense within these characters minds but within the context of the story it's frustrating it's, as an audience member yeah and at this point i don't know if i was like you know kind of ex not expecting too much mm -hmm. That it didn't really impact me that much. I just kind of <laughs> yeah. read there like they gave up on Leo. I'm like, okay, sure, let's follow the Iron Revenants. <laughs> I don't yeah. care about Leo either. Yeah. <laughs> He's just a human MacGuffin. Yeah, that we have forgot about for the past whatever. Yeah. yeah exactly. But on paper, from a storytelling fundamental standpoint, you should fulfill that original promise. Before or, yeah. In yeah. some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Not just give up on it entirely. Yeah, that was definitely bizarre. Yeah. And it's like, good thing those two quests ended up... Intersecting. It, but, like, that was... It's not purely coincidental. No. Because I don't still don't even know why they captured Prince Leo. I think... He was captured by the same people that are yeah. working with the ghost myths. But why capture Prince Leo? I think it's because they were going to hold him ransom I to think, start a war. I think that's what it was. They want to start a war with the House of Bone. Yeah. So they capture this prince mm -hmm. to instigate conflict. Yeah. Which is fine. That works. Yeah. And it makes sense. Um, but my problem isn't with, like... Because at the end of the story, um, Leo and... I'm sorry, not Leo. Julian and Ren are like, let's go investigate the Iron Revenants. That's more important. Mm -hmm. They follow the trail and... At the city where they find the Iron Revenants, Leo happens to show up there too. Which is where he wasn't supposed to be. Yes. So He was supposed to be on some coastal town in the Iron Citadel. Yeah. Instead they find him in the middle of the haunted territory. Yeah. Which is unexpected. With this, like, city that Julian didn't even know existed. Yeah. Like, it's, I don't know, it's a shock yeah. for both of them, but especially Julian, because he's like... I'm supposed to on? be the prince here, and there's an entire city with like workshops building armor mm -hmm. and stuff like people that people live here yeah it's an active city yeah um my problem isn't with like leo happening to show up there because mm -hmm. it's not coincidental yeah um it's part of the bad guys plan the bad guys who were betraying um prince julian mm -hmm. um my problem is with the way that the main characters find my problem is with the way those characters get to that point. Yeah, like I wish, I wish maybe there was some, maybe they found a note or a marking mm -hmm. from Leo along the way where it was like, I'm, I don't know, or they tracked him or mm -hmm. somehow they found that those two plots were together before just showing up and finding that they were together. Yeah, I agree. It, there, There is a solution here. Yeah. There is a way to make this more satisfying where it doesn't feel like uh, incidental that they happen across Leo. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a problem. I don't know how, but it, it's... Yeah. So this is... I know I'm going to sound like a Brandon Sanderson acolyte. <laughs> but Which you are. I but... am. And I'm going to try to not bring it up so often because it can be annoying. No, you're fine. But... um. In his lectures on YouTube, where mm -hmm. he talks about storytelling, which are amazing, by the way. They're totally free. There's like 12 of them. Uh -huh. There's not 12. There's maybe six. Um, he talks about how you can uh, subvert expectations for a reader mm -hmm. in a satisfying way by promising them something at the beginning of the story and then giving them that promise at the end, plus a little extra. Okay. So I think that's what this uh, writer was trying to attempt with mm -hmm. this ending, but it was just kind of done... A little bit clumsily. Yeah. Um, the analogy that Brandon Sanderson uses is that 
you promise your kid a toy car for Christmas, and then on Christmas you give them a real car, okay. right? So it's not what they expected, it's but it's better. Yeah. Um, and then he uses the uh, Star Wars when Luke blows up the Death Star. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't watched the movie in a long time, so I don't oh, understand the example. Me either. We're <laughs> so like, that's a bad yeah, example. Star Wars. Yes, like in Star Wars. <laughs> um, basically, that's that's a satisfying way to subvert yeah. readers' expectations, is, is to give them a little more plus extra. And I think what they were trying to do with this story was the original plot is um, Ren and Julian saving the prince. Mm-hmm. That, in and of itself, is fine, yeah. but not super interesting. So let's introduce this ghost smith element Mm -hmm. and Ren's mysterious past, Mm -hmm. which is interesting, ostensibly. Mm -hmm. And why is Julian's... uh, His uncle. Yeah, why is he being betrayed to, like... Yes, why is he being betrayed by his uncle? Yeah. Which we should mention, the person betraying Julian is is his uncle, the regent. Yes, he wants to be king. Yes, because he's apparently not a blood heir to the throne, and Julian is a threat to that. Um... We'll get to that later. Yes. And I've said that 12 times by now. That's okay. So you can make a drinking game out of this podcast if yeah. you wanted to. Every time I say we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, and I'm not trying to shit on this book. And I'm not trying to shit on this book. <laughs> that too. You will get hammered by the end of this podcast. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Uh, you were talking about... The two plot points yes. intersecting. So you have um, saving Prince Leo and discovering more about the ghost smiths. Hi, dog. Uh, Roswell's our guest for today. We need a door so badly. Yeah, we don't have a door. <laughs> oh my god. Just don't interact with him. And he'll go away. He's just like a revenant. He's gone. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't go in there. Fuck. Oh, you shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> Dumb <I'm> so dog. Stupid. <laughs> We are smart of that dumb dog. Um, <laughs> okay, two plot anyway, points Anyway, we have these two plot points intersecting, right? And I understand on paper what they're trying to go for. Yeah. You want this exciting ending where you find out that Julian's being betrayed by his uncle and um, Ren has, she doesn't let, she's learning more about her mysterious origin mm-hmm. um, and these new powers. Mm-hmm. And you save Prince Leo at the same time. Yeah. Right? Like, it's hard to do, to put all those two, yeah. all those things together. Um, it just feels so lazy to just have the main characters say, uh, we don't really care about Leo anymore, do we? <laughs> yeah, I really wish there was a way to intertwine those more seamlessly and from yeah. an earlier... Like, yeah. if you planted the seed of maybe... But, like, Julian doesn't even know about that city, so how could you plant that seed earlier or something yeah. like that? That's not for us to decide. No. I'm just explaining the way that I felt when I read this. Yeah. And I think I know what they're trying to attempt. Yeah. Um, even though, you know, the pieces didn't fit together that well, I understand what they were building towards. Yeah. And it is, it works. Yeah, it does. It's it... not effective, but it works. Yeah. It's kind of like our podcast studio. <laughs> yes! <laughs> this is the perfect analogy (laughs) yeah i i agree with that and like even as those pieces were starting to fit together in that city when they Mm -hmm. were discovering who had betrayed julian and discovering who had prince leo and also the who the ghost smiths were who the ghost smiths were and who was was working with who it even still felt a little bit disjointed yeah a little bit like you're like logistically they're answering all of the questions yes but the way that we got there was a little bit clunky. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, serviceable, good. Yeah. Not my favorite, and really hard to do. Y- yeah. Um, there's a reason why people only have like five thirty books. Yep. Those books are really good, and there's a lot of things to juggle at the same time. Yeah. Um, and you're trying to give a satisfying ending for all these characters. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not that many characters. It's two characters, yeah. but still, it can be complex. Yeah. Well, especially when those two characters come from. Literal opposites. Yes. Opposite sides of the war, opposite sides of everything. Like, how do you get those two intertwined? Yeah. Again? I don't oh, have yeah. an easy solution. Yeah. Um, but it, it's good enough. Mm-hmm. So, the final conflict of the story. Ren and Julian saving Prince Leo. Yeah. Um, they enter this mysterious city, and they find out... They enter this mysterious city because the boy says to the Iron Revenant, now go to the... 
city. It's like called yeah. Castadon or something. I think so, yeah. Or Castellon. Yeah. Go to this city and wait for her instructions. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ren and Julian, Julian must know what that city is. Yeah. How else would he know At where to go? Point. Yeah. Unless he's like, the boy is like, here are the coordinates, travel 12 he's miles like, south. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it must have been an old city that they've repaired. Yeah. That Julian Probably. knew about because he studied the maps. Yeah. That That's makes sense. Good enough. Yeah, that, that makes, makes sense. sense. So they go to Castadon to follow the Iron Revenant, and they find out that the regent of the Iron Citadel, Julian's uncle, mm -hmm. is going to show up there too. Yeah. Um, and then Julian realizes that his uncle had betrayed him his whole life, mm -hmm. um, and he's this very evil villain. Yeah. Who loves to monologue. Yeah. Yeah. And um, explain all of his plans and all of yes. his reasons. <laughs> and he's been working together with the Ghost Smith boy's mother yes the corpse queen yes who we haven't mentioned up until this point. no it, 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 but it's okay there's it's a lot fine. to remember yes this is gonna be like a three hour long podcast <laughs> part one and part two baby yeah um but it's okay we can make these mistakes that's okay um so ren and julian find out yeah that the regent is going to show up to uh parlay with the corpse queen mm -hmm. Because he and the Corpse Queen are working together to overthrow the House of Bone. Yes. And the Corpse Queen and the Regent said uh, they planned together to capture Prince Leo and to capture one other person, mm -hmm. Ren. Yes. And the Regent saw it as an opportunity to assassinate his nephew. Yeah. Um, but that did not go entirely according to plan, mm -hmm. um, we learn. Um, Ren... And Julian sneak into the meeting place where the regent and the corpse queen. I I'm doing a bad job of explaining this. I think it's fine. Okay. The Iron Regent takes a room at the inn and says no one else can take these rooms. So Iron and Julian and Ren mm -hmm. sneak into the inn to overhear what the regent's plans are. Mm -hmm. As the regent explains to the captain who assassinated Julian supposedly um, reports to yeah. the regent he's like here's his helmet he's dead yeah and he's like but you don't have a body yeah. and he says what about the what about ren what about the bonesmith he says well she died down there too yeah and so the regent's like good enough for me but the corpse queen's gonna be a little upset right yeah so julian is so pissed off while they're spying on them from the other room that he splinters the wood <laughs> yeah. into his bare hands his bare tiny hands yeah um, and then the guards hear him, and they try to break into the room, and Ren is like, no, I'm going to stay here and fight with you, but Julian's like, no, you have to get away. Mm -hmm. So he convinces her to leave out the window by pretending to go along with her, but then he shuts the window and locks it, and locks says, it. this is what I had to do, I have to face my uncle. Because I love you. No, Just because kidding. he betrayed me. But yes, he does love her. Yes. He doesn't say that, <laughs> but he wants to protect her. Mm -hmm. So he allows himself to get captured and he faces his uncle. Mm -hmm. um, and then his uncle monologues at him. Yes, again. Right. And says, I'm very evil. Yes. Oh, he Whoa, killed oh, Captain oh, Royce. Oh, 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 oh. He killed his own captain. Oh, who failed okay. in his mission to kill, kill Julian, Julian. And, and to capture Ren. Yes. Um, which is kind of stupid. Y like, why would you? It, it, it's so much more expensive to hire a new employee than to yes. fire one. Yes. And as soon as you kill Captain Royce, you're going to have to promote someone else. Yeah, and have to trust them to keep all your dirty little secrets. Yeah. This guy needs to take some notes. Captain Royce might be a dud, but he's at least your friend. Yeah. But she did that to show just how evil the yeah. regent is. Whoa. Just whatever. <laughs> but um, uh, the regent captures Julian uh -huh. and monologues at him again and says, I basically wanted to take power. Mm -hmm. and you weren't capable of it, and neither was your father. Mm -hmm. He implies that he were Julian's father, too. So Julian gets extra angry. Yeah. And then the corpse queen shows up and says, I'm not meeting you at the inn. You have to meet me outside. Mm -hmm. So the regent leaves to meet the corpse queen outside the inn and leaves Julian tied up in the corner. Oh, and Leo tied up in the corner. Oh, my God. There's yeah. so much to remember. This is, this is a lot. <laughs> yeah. And feel free to chime in. I feel like I'm dominating the conversation No, it's again. fine. I don't know what to say. There's a lot of details. Yeah. A lot of things happening at the end of this book. Yeah. And I don't know if it's interesting listening. 
but it is what it is. Yep. Anyway, Julian and Leo are tied up in the corner. Mm -hmm. Ren's outside. The regent is left, and they're being guarded by two iron reverends. Yeah. Leo frees himself from his bonds by using his, his gold, gold canine magic. teeth. Yeah, he's so he has a gold tooth, so he's like, mm, magic. Mm-hmm. He somehow <laughs> uses some gold in his mouth mm -hmm. to make his canines extra sharp. Yeah, like they they took all of the gold off of him, but he's like, good thing I have gold caps on my teeth. Yeah. Or like, he keeps it in his mouth so he can use that. And that works. Yeah. Uh, we should also mention briefly that the point of Leo, he was just kind of a human MacGuffin. Mm -hmm. Ren wants to save him because, because they're friends, mm -hmm. and they do have a sweet relationship mm -hmm. because they have some things in common. But Leo, we do have a couple of chapters from his perspective that could essentially be summed up by one sentence, which is that... They took him to the inn. They yeah. put a bag on his head. Well, while he's being captured, I mean, when he's captured, while he's traveling to the inn, mm -hmm. he apparently gathers information and spreads rumors. Yeah, like, like we get to see this he he understands his station in life that he's a spare spare and he's like people don't take me seriously because i make myself not be taken seriously mm -hmm. like he, we get to see the side of him where it's like he purposefully manipulates the people around him into thinking that he's not a serious threat yeah and so he gets information from like the guard who's taking care of him or serving someone or mm -hmm. something like that which was interesting i like to see i liked seeing him purposefully manipulate that so it was like he at least had something to do useless yeah um but ultimately it doesn't really lead to that much mm -mm. he just threatens the regent with that he says i spread rumors that you assassinated your yeah your nephew um and that makes him mad mm -hmm. so like all of his gathering his information all of his spreading rumors, we haven't, maybe it'll come into effect in the next yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. Where it's like the people of the Iron Citadel don't trust the regent because yeah. they think that he assassinated Julian, who's the heir to the throne. Mm -hmm. And it's because of Leo's clever, quick thinking. Yeah. Um, uh, it kind of works. Yeah. It's a little clunky again. Yeah. Um, but I think they're really just trying to give Leo more of a character than just being a human MacGuffin. Yeah. So I'm fine with it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Leo and Julian are tied up in the corner, guarded by two Iron Revenants, which is a little weird, because Ren busts in through the door to save the day. Mm -hmm. And instead of fighting them, she tells the Iron Revenants just to stop. Yeah. And they stop. Yeah, they and obey then they leave. her. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's not super interesting plot again. Yeah. It's like they're avoiding making the Iron Revenants powerful because they just don't want to deal with, like, how do I make them overcome this obstacle? Yeah. Like, it would have been more, I think it would have been interesting to see them fight Leo and Julian and mm -hmm. then have her come in at the end and have them stop. That way we can still see some of that conflict, see the serious threat that it is, and then see that Ren can take care of it in yeah. that way. Yeah, I, don't know. I agree. And once again, I'm going to bring up my Brandon Sanderson fandom, <laughs> but my favorite magic systems are ones with a cost. Yeah. And I don't really feel like Ren is all that powerful. Well, well she actually feels very powerful mm -hmm. because she can just tell any ghost to stop. Mm -hmm. She can just command it. We don't yeah. know how. We also don't know what it costs her. Yeah. So it would be interesting as if, like, she told them to stop, but she can only command one at a time. Yeah. Right? So she has to fight the other one. Mm -hmm. And the three of them can take out one Iron Revenant on their own because Julian uses his iron powers to, like, suck off the armor. Yeah, yeah. And then it's just an ordinary Revenant ghost, and so Ren can fight that, subdue it somehow. Mm -hmm. Maybe she has some other new ghost powers where she's, like, she can break the anchor bone. Yeah. And then you don't need a Reaper anymore. Yeah. It's just, come on, give it a little bit more. Sorry, I just spat everywhere. Oh, I didn't My even God. notice. You're fine. Um. Give us a little bit more conflict here. Yeah. Give us a little bit more reason for Ren having these ghost powers. Mm -hmm. Instead, like, I don't know what the limits of what she's capable of. Yeah, well, plus it's like, it seems like asking some paranormal being to stop and being able to do mm -hmm. that, that's a lot to do. 
That's so I would want to see I want to see her be like tired at the very or least. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. I like I like that too when you can tell that magic is wears on the user or yeah. something like that. Like we need to know what those rules are. Yeah. Otherwise, how can we anticipate how they're going to overcome those challenges? Mm-hmm. Um, this is a perfect example of that. Yeah. We have a scene where we understand Julie and Leo are tied up, and they're being guarded by two Iron Revenants. Mm-hmm. How do you get out of that room? Yeah. Ren comes in and tells them to stop. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, how do you get out of a forest filled with Revenants? You just outrun them. Uh, yeah. It's like, ah. Uh, yeah, I want You can make more... them so much more interesting. We need more stakes, right? Yeah. Um, and if we know what the rules of her ghost magic are like, or her bonesmith magic are like, mm-hmm. then we can say, okay, she's stuck in a room with two iron revenants. Well, she can only command one at a, one at a time. Yeah. So she can tell one to stop. Maybe she could tell one, one to, to fight, fight the, the other. other. Yeah. That would be interesting. Yeah. Instead, it just feels like this all-powerful uh, mind control over all ghosts, mm-hmm. no matter the range, no matter the number. Like, we need some limitations. Yeah. That's what makes I it agree. interesting. I agree. Um. Yeah. So anyway, they escape from that room, mm-hmm. and they overhear the corpse queen talking with the regent about the bonesmith that he was supposed to capture. Mm-hmm. And the corpse queen says, I don't care if you think she's dead, I needed her. Yeah. And then she turns to leave the, the uh, regent. Mm-hmm. Have I also been calling them iron regents this whole time? No. Okay. <laughs> I was worried about that. I don't think so. Okay. I think you've been saying Iron Revenants. Okay, I can't remember. I think you've said Iron Revenants. All right. <clears throat> the Corpse Queen turns to walk away, and she uses some telepathy to communicate with Ren, because mm-hmm. she notices her spying from the roof. Yeah. And she says, come and find me. Mm-hmm. You'll find your true destiny or whatever. Yeah. And so Ren is kind of tempted by that. Mm-hmm. And I think... I thought that was interesting. Mm-hmm. I like, I I enjoy when characters have secrets in the books. Yeah, I really do, and I like that she's like, oh, maybe I could go do that. I do want to know who this person yeah, is and yeah. why I have these mysterious ghost powers. And you can see the appeal. You can see, and being that the corpse, corpse queen, queen. I was gonna say corpse bride. The corpse <laughs> queen obviously knew they were up there and didn't give that away from them yeah gives them gives her some brownie points you know what i mean like it's interesting yeah that that stuff is interesting um wanting to learn more about ran and her past and her ghost powers and who that kid was and who's that with the matching ring yes choose the right that is (laughs) his ctr (laughs) ring yeah choose the revenant there you go Mm. that would work (laughs) Yeah, um, that is primarily, not primarily, that is one of the reasons why I kept reading, is wanting to learn more about yeah. Virgo's powers. Yeah. Um, yes, so Julian, Ren, and Leo, they're finally together, all three of them again, mm-hmm. and they have to escape this town. Yeah. So they formulate a plan. They say the regent is going to find out that Leo, we've saved him, mm-hmm. and that Julian is gone. Mm-hmm. What are they going to do? They're going to send out search party. Yeah. And they're going to split all their men up. How many men are there? There's over a dozen. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Yeah. And so, Julian's like, oh, I know all this because I'm the prince. Surprise! Yeah, I mean, she knew that at the... that point. But he's like, this is like the protocol that we would follow. Or... Yeah. Right. Yes. Um. So they start searching the town and they send riders out from all four directions or whatever mm-hmm. to keep looking for them. I thought at this point... They were going to do something where it's like, let's wait until all of the regent's guards leave, and then we can assassinate the regent. Oh, that's interesting. I thought that could have been cool. Yeah, that would have been interesting. Like, why not? Yeah. You have an advantage. Yeah. You have Ren, who's the greatest ghost fighter of her generation. Yeah. Julian is a fully-fledged iron sword, Mm -hmm. and he wants revenge because... Leo has witty banter that he can add to the table. He (laughs) can bite him in the neck (laughs) with his gold teeth. Turn him into a statue. Yes. <laughs> that would be cool. What if the gold like some sort of Midas. vampires? Oh, I was thinking. Oh, yeah, Midas like Midas. That would be cool. Okay, let's brainstorm about this. <laughs> yeah. 
let's make the goldsmiths way more interesting than they actually are. Yes. That would be cool if you, like, were a goldsmith, you could touch someone else with, with gold and turn them into a statue. Yeah, that would be interesting. Or if you had to bite them with your gold teeth, yeah. which all goldsmiths are born with. And you just hide them when you don't want to be seen. Yes. And then you can turn someone else into a goldsmith. Oh, yeah. And they have to eat gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You turn just their blood into gold, and then they slowly die as it That's ma- cool. metal metallicizes in their body. That would be awesome. <laughs> and then you get more gold. Yeah, that's how you get rich. Yeah. That's an interesting world-building element. Mm-hmm. That does not come into play. <laughs> Little do you know it's there. <laughs> yeah, it's in the next book. Yeah. That would be awesome. Um, I thought they were going to do something like that with the region. Mm-hmm. Instead of... Hightail it out of town. Yeah. Instead of wait for a couple of riders who are leaving, take them out, and then run away. Yeah. Um, which is fine. It works mm-hmm. again. You could have made it a bit more interesting, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. But they are just trying to get these people back to the breach fort, which is what this whole story has been building towards. Mm-hmm. Um, so the three of them run through the haunted territory to make it back to the breach fort fast as possible and this is the part of the story that we've been anticipating because finally julian and ren are going to have to betray one another Mm -hmm. because ren wants to bring uh the prince back to his home and she also wants to become a valkyr again Mm -hmm. and to get the approval of her father Mm -hmm. um julian on the other hand um well he likes ren for one yeah but um, he also needs the prince. It's a little less clear for him at this point because he's like, well, now he my betrayed. now my regent wants to kill me mm-hmm. and has sent men to kill me. Like, I don't belong at home. People think I'm dead, probably. Yeah. So he's kind of like... He's on the lam. I guess he could use the prince, hold him as ransom, and then sell him and use the money to help his kingdom. I can't I remember if so. that's the logic he uses for Maybe. keeping the prince. Yeah. But he also can't go with Ren because he's... Um, Ironsmith. They'll yeah, kill him over the heir to the Iron Citadel. Yeah. They'd kill him for that. They also saw him at the uh, kidnapping. Kidnapping. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the very least, he'd be put in prison with them. So yeah. he's not safe in either country. Yeah. Basically. Um, and he tells Ren that obviously the prince was betrayed too. Mm-hmm. So if you take him back there, you're just putting him back in his... Uh, captures clutches. Yeah. Which is a good point. And he's right. Yes. So Julian's plan is to stay in the free, in the haunted territory, in the Iron Citadel. He says, come back to my home. I have an estate. I have servants. We can make a game plan. We can hang out there. Yeah. Oh, and his sister's there. Yeah. And he should be concerned about her life because she's also Which an heir to the throne. Yeah, we, we've heard mentioned a couple of times yeah in the she's story. like a younger sister right yeah and he has a bracelet that she made him yeah which is like oh big tough guy has a sweet spot for his sister yeah <laughs> and i like that character i did too that. i liked it yeah uh, that's actually one of my favorite character archetypes mm-hmm. these really tough stoic guys or gals mm-hmm. or envies mm-hmm. um does envy mean non-binary yes okay yes it's just a fun abbreviation yes um who have a soft spot for something really cute. Yes. I, I, I really like that. There's there's a, one of... Never mind. Okay. If you ever read Sarah J. Mass, I can't say that. I mean, I will. Okay. If you want to, to make me read Sarah J. Mass. I think you should at least read A Court of Thorns and Roses. Okay. It's so bad. Please, can we please talk how bad it is? Yes, we can. We'll make that anyway. our next mission. <laughs> um. Anyway, so they're both in a bind here. Mm-hmm. And... Um, they both have to decide what they're going to do. Should Ren betray her people mm-hmm. and stay in the Iron Citadel with Julian and try to overthrow the regent with the prince by their side? Mm-hmm. Or should she return home, even though she knows that the prince would be in danger there? Yeah, but she and, potentially could get back to her original yes, stasis. And earn her father's approval for saving the prince. Mm-hmm. Just this huge... It is a huge accomplishment. Yeah. So she decides to betray Julian, mm-hmm. which is a great moment yeah. because you do like these characters and you, you think, want them to be friends. And it, it's it's, I enjoyed reading that chapter because you could tell how much she didn't want to do it. Yeah. Like she ties him up and leaves him there, and she's like, 
I wish I didn't because he's going to wake up and he's going to be pissed. And, mm-hmm. like, I don't want to do this to him, but I need to get the prince back. I need to get back. Yes. Another reason for her to stay behind mm-hmm. um, with Julian. Um, and Julian tells her this when um, he gets tied up. Mm-hmm. And he realizes that Ren's just betrayed him. Mm-hmm. He says, don't you want to stay behind and learn the truth about who you really are? Yeah. Because... If you go back home and pretend to be a bonesmith again, you can't tell your father that you found the corpse queen and you found this ring and you mm-hmm. have these ghost abilities. Yeah. You're going to try to hide from that? Mm-hmm. Or do you want to find out more about, you know, where you really came from? Yeah. I, I really like that. And I like that, like, sometimes I'm like, damn, Julian has a good point. Why, why would you not mm-hmm. go with what he's saying? But I there is know. a good explanation for that. Mm-hmm. And this is why I think the story is best at the very end Mm -hmm. is that her original motivation to becoming a Valkyr was for her father's approval Mm -hmm. it really didn't matter so much that she liked being Valkyr inherently yeah it's that that's what her father wanted for her Mm -hmm. she's always wanted his approval yeah so the reason why even though uh Julian makes some very good points she returns the prince to the breach for is for that selfish motivation yeah it's because she wants to know that her father loves her yeah it's definitely interesting. I like, I like, I like that, and I like that. Even though you've seen her go through this whole entire character arc, and all that she's known about the world has been flipped upside down and changed, mm-hmm. she's still like, "It's my, it's my baby girl trauma." Yeah. I I will go back to what I know. Do you know it's what true. I mean? Yeah. It's well, interesting. We're all our own worst enemies at some point. Yeah. Those yeah. original things that are baked into our minds and we're kids, mm-hmm. our worldview is formed, and that's how we make decisions for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Unless they're directly confronted and mm-hmm. we're brave enough to let go of those things. Yeah. But for Ren, it's not enough just to let go of this need for her father's approval. Mm-hmm. She needs to either see it firsthand or to experience what it's like to um, have him love her. Yeah. For doing something so grand and amazing as saving the prince. Mm-hmm. So, Ren and Leo make it back to the breach fort, and that's exactly what happens. Yes. Her father's there. She He embraces her, says, I'm so proud of you. Mm-hmm. You're amazing. But hurry, let's um, get you into a bed and rest. Yeah. Right? Let me take care of you, and I'll yeah. make you a Valkyrie. And, and then they it. also catch Julian on the ridge line behind them. Yes. And she's like... Because somehow Julian follows them. fast enough. Yeah. Which is fine. They both escaped on horseback, Leo and Ren, uh-huh. and Julian used his whip sword to swing across caverns to take a shortcut to the breach fort. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that makes whatever. Yeah. So Julian is captured mm-hmm. while Ren is being praised by her father, and Julian sees, oh, she is a graven. Yeah. Her father is the brother, or she's the niece of the man who killed all of my people and yeah. my, probably my it, father. I always get bothered. This is just a Mallory thing that mm-hmm. bothers me. When characters do the same thing to each other and they're both pissed off about it, I'm like, you did the same thing. Yeah. That always bugs me, but that's just because I am who I am. Yeah. It makes for a good story. I enjoy it in stories, but I'm like... Yeah. I see what you're saying. <laughs> you're, you're saying that Ren or uh, Julian hid the fact that he was royalty from mm-hmm. Ren for a while too mm-hmm. until it was no longer convenient yeah and then Ren did the same thing to him and he was very upset at her for doing yes. that and Which he doesn't see the that? irony in that yes I yes. think in real life we do that to each other too <laughs> yes and we don't see it until hindsight mm-hmm. I'm like hmm that was a little childish of yeah. myself yeah exactly exactly but they are kids too yeah and I I enjoy it in the book in the context of of stories i'm like okay yeah but i don't know it always bugs me (laughs) yeah i know what you mean um so ren is taking up taking up to her father's room to report what happened and she gets all the praise and adoration from her father that she's ever wanted Mm -hmm. she even gets ghostbane back yeah somehow her father got it from lady svetlana and then brought it back to her Mm -hmm. and he knew that Ren was going to show up again for him to give it to her at this moment, which is a little weird. How do you explain that? But it doesn't matter. Yeah. We know what Ghostbane represents to her, um, and she gets everything that she's ever wanted, but it still feels a little hollow. Yeah. And And this is also piggybacking off of, like, 
he, her father is lying to her about her past and yeah. like keeping secrets about what actually happened between her uncle and the Ironsmiths. Like mm-hmm. it's it's interesting for her to have learned all of this stuff and come back and see that he's still lying and still manipulating. Yeah. She saw evidence of what Locke really did there, mm-hmm. which was kill everybody. Yeah. Including his own people in that final war, mm-hmm. committing this mass atrocity. Mm-hmm. And she suspects that Locke did it by accessing the power of this well. Mm-hmm. Um, and she gives her father the opportunity in this moment to be honest about those events. Mm-hmm. And he chooses not to. Yeah. To lie to her, to placate her, and say, You did everything right. Don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. Make you a Valkyrie again if that'll make you stop being so curious about this past. Yeah. And that rubs her the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So she decides in this moment to be completely honest with her father. Which was interesting. It is good. Yeah. Because she realizes she has always wanted her father's approval like this. Mm -hmm. um, But it doesn't feel right. Mm -mm. And she thinks, okay, will he still, quote unquote, love me if he knows the real me 100% of the way? Mm -hmm. So she tells him about her ghost smith powers Mm -hmm. and he kind of brushes it off yeah like it's no big deal Mm -hmm. or like he knows something about that that he won't tell her yeah um and it's at that moment that she truly does change and realize that she doesn't need the approval of her father anymore to make her happy yeah which is great. It's the best part of the book, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Mm-hmm. It's when this internal conflict culminates. Yeah. And and it's interesting that sometimes I feel like in storytelling, authors will have an initial goal and then get to it and change their mind. Mm-hmm. But I like that she still completes the goal of getting her father's approval and yeah. then realizes that's not what she needed the whole time. Yes. Like, we still get that satisfying, closed, mm-hmm. tied up, nice... And now it's going to be starting the next kind of arc or something yeah. like that. Like, I really enjoy that. Yeah, exactly. She does have a good character arc. And it makes sense. And I did feel um, some actual emotions yeah. about it. <laughs> you say that like you're like, you don't feel anything. <laughs> I usually don't. <laughs> yeah. Not until I read a good book. Good. Um, no, I'm joking. I feel emotions. I'm not a serial killer. Um. <laughs> I don't just... Next week we're reading I'm Not a Serial Killer. Yes. I do want to read that book, by the way. I've read it. I read it in high school. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I like Dan Wells. Yeah. Um, I just haven't read any of his books. <laughs> I like him personally. I go to lunch with him every month. So yeah, we're best kidding. friends. Me, him, and Brando Sando. <laughs> Brando Sando. The three of us have a podcast together. Oh, nice. Is I'm behind the camera. Than this one? <laughs> so I don't really show up. It's much better than this one. Sorry, but that's because I'm in front of the camera. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, we were talking about character arc. The character arc. The character yeah. arc for Ren is good. Um, I feel like I'm going to try to wrap this up as succinctly as possible yeah, because we've good. gone on for so long. But um, Ren finds out that her father has been lying to her mm-hmm. and that Locke was a war criminal and um, the Mr. Graven, mm-hmm. he has intentions of starting another war with the ironsmiths because he wants to experience the same glory that his brother did mm-hmm. he wants to be mythologized yeah and he he kind of lives in the shadow of Locke. yeah that's part of why i think his mother doesn't like him because yes he, he doesn't live up to that the most he did during the war was have a bastard child mm-hmm. you know what i mean yeah exactly and there's a nice narrative pa- parallel between um what mr graven has experienced from his mother where she's being distant and there's like nothing that he can do to ever achieve that approval mm-hmm. and um mr graven's relationship with Ren. yeah it's nice it's a nice Just great. Little... makes perfect sense what's that called um Ooh. i call generational it generational trauma yeah there you go mm-hmm. and for the story it's a nice parallel between those two characters mm-hmm. it explains their motivations really clearly mm-hmm. um so we find out that mr graven set up Ren from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. He dug the pit. He paid off Inara. Did he pay her? I think so. He said, I'll make you... I think it was like I'll make, a, worth your while. I'll make you an incredible background. I'll give you the best position. Yeah. I think that's what it was. 
Yeah, it was either way, like she that. gets a reward for betraying Ren. Yeah, and I mean, she hates Ren, so she would do it. She's anyway. like, I don't, yeah. But um, she doesn't tell Ren that her father paid her to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and Mr. Graven also uh, has been working with the Iron Regent. Yes. Right. Yeah. I almost called him Revenant. <laughs> With the regent of the Iron Citadel, that's what mm -hmm. I should say. Um, to kidnap Leo, he planned for Leo to be there, planned for Ren to be there. Yeah, he orchestrated this whole thing. The person who betrayed Ren was her father. Oh, uh -huh. um, sorry. No, it's okay. And it's this good way to tie it all together from beginning to end. Yeah, and it's also like, oh, the bad guy wasn't who you thought the bad guy was. Yeah, it's nice mm -hmm. and well done. Mm -hmm. Um, and it didn't come out of nowhere. And it makes yeah. sense within the story. Yeah. So, yeah. like I said, when they tie all these things together, Ren's character arc with the plot and Julian's the relationship between mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Julian's involvement with uh, the mm -hmm. the regent yeah. and the regent uh, conspir conspirating, co-inspirating, being a co-conspirator with the <laughs> corpse queen. Yeah. All the, those th things coming together works well mm -hmm. by the end. Yeah. But for me, the um, best part about it is obviously Ren's internal character conflict mm -hmm. and her arc. Yeah, I really like that too. Reaching a good, satisfying conclusion. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder how much Mr. Graven knows about the corpse queen. Yeah. Because, I mean... He, d he thinks she's dead. Yeah, I mean, like, that's Ren's mom. Yeah, that's right? what he learns. That's what, so, I don't know. It's interesting, if he's working with all these people, I wonder how much he knows about the Corpse Queen, or who it yeah. is, or if that's even a player on the table. Like, I'm if guessing, the Red Regent keeps that a secret, or... Mm -hmm. I'm guessing he hasn't communicated personally with the Regent. Yeah. Like, the Regent might not know that he's working together with the Gravens to start another war. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't think that's explained. No. Or if it is, I didn't understand it. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, we eventually learn Ren overhears a conversation between Odile mm -hmm. and her father talking about where Ren comes from. Mm -hmm. Why she has ghostsmith powers. Yes. And she says, uh, Ren is not your daughter. Mm -hmm. um, she's actually Locke's daughter. Yeah. She fell in love with this woman before the war. And this woman turned out to be the corpse queen. She had ghostsmith abilities. She manipulated Locke and Mr. Graven. I love that we keep calling him Mr. Graven. I know. Graven. I don't remember his first name. And the woman had twins. Yeah. And the other child is it's this necromancer it. boy yeah. who has an identical ring. Mm -hmm. And Odile says, I tried to tell you. I tried to tell you that she's alive and she's the corpse queen. And that ran his ghost powers. You just ignore me. You just ignore me. You actually killed the messenger. You yeah. didn't want to know. So that's the end of the story. Yeah. And then there's a sequel because Ren escapes, tells mm -hmm. her father, I don't love you. Yes. I don't need your love. I don't need your love. So she breaks out Leo. She breaks out Julian. The best part of the whole book. You're what? forgetting it. When they're trying to break out Julian from the prison and they're like, how do we get him out? And then he's like, oh, yeah. My metal arm. Yes. <sighs> It breaks the lock. I'll use my Thanos strength to yeah, escape. Yeah, he's got a whole Bucky Barnes thing going on. <laughs> yeah, he does. I really Bucky enjoyed Barnes that. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I didn't see that coming either. But I, I also did didn't see, see Ren having ghost powers. I, I saw both of those coming. <laughs> I the know. second she was like, he was so strong on his left arm. And they're like, <laughs> I didn't get they're it. Like, they're like, wow, good thing. Good thing. Well, they even mentioned, they're like, oh, people have tried to put iron mm -hmm. body parts on and it doesn't take. I know, it didn't click with me. And then like, he's, an like, he's like, fact. don't take off my glove while we're naked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you squeeze my bicep too tight, I'm uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm a little dense. No, it's okay. It's not. I, I <laughs> don't think you're dense. No, I'm good at I think remembering I'm a the story. I'm a fucking read. genius. You are. <laughs> just kidding. It's true. We're good at different things. Yeah, we're dumb in different ways. Yes. Um, yeah, so Julian uses his iron strength to escape. Yeah, she's got an iron arm. And Ren is like, ew, I'm not into that. She's like, actually... No, thank you. Um, turn off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> and then they escape. They escape, but before they escape, 
uh, Ren's father confronts them, and that's where she says, I don't need your love. Yes, Ren's father also kills Odile and frames Ren for it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, he's setting up this a whole lot of crap for her, so she's like, okay, I really gotta get out of here. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And as um, they're obviously outnumbered, Ren, Julian, and Leo are outnumbered as they're about to escape, mm-hmm. and as the guards, Mr. Graven commands the guards to capture Julian again, and then she uses her ghost myth powers to break the bones in their body. Yes, which is this kind of horrifying... It's almost like a third new power. Great moment, yeah. I think I think it has something to do with being the daughter of a bonesmith and a ghostsmith. Yeah, I think so too. And we hear about ghostsmiths who go too far and mm-hmm. can control spirits In people. living bodies. So I think it's a hybrid of the two. Where it's like, they explain in the beginning that bonesmiths can only control dead bones. Mm-hmm. That must be what it is. Ghosts are afraid of dead bones. Yes. We finally figured it out. It took us three hours. Three hours. <laughs> they can control dead bone. Yeah. Um, but a bone smith ghost smith hybrid can control living bone. Yeah. That's what I thought. I think so. That's happening. what I understood it as. Yeah. I thought it was really cool and also like It was a nice surprise. It was cool. Yeah. And it was a good way to overcome that conflict. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and then much more interesting than yes. stop. Yeah. It does almost feel a little bit too all-powerful, but we don't know the limits of that power yet. Yes. And we'll I find want out more limits. One. I want more limits to her power or so more I. cost. For me, that's more power. interesting for my yeah. system. Because otherwise, it's like... You would just be like, boom, done, boom, power, boom, yeah. done. So that power that she used to break the, the soldier's bones in their arms mm-hmm. is this must be the same power that Locke used to kill all those soldiers. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. So... Does that power... Maybe not. Well, I don't know. I feel because like that's not too far Because he's not, not a ghost smith, bone smith hybrid, is he? But if he used the power from the well... Maybe that's like maybe ghost smith power. Maybe that's ghost smith power. Or maybe it just heightened his so much that he could That he could now control that. living bone. Yeah. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. And hopefully it's explained. Hopefully. Um... But her being able to do that, Mm -hmm. it was hinted at in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel like deus ex, where it was like this magical new power appeared to her. She had been not learning how to use it, but learning that she's capable of this power. Yeah. Slowly over time. Yeah, there's a good progression of her unlocking or discovering different features of her magic. So even though I'm not dumb enough to anticipate something like, or I'm sorry, even though I'm not smart enough enough to not anticipate it. I'm dumb enough to not anticipate a moment like that. (laughs) I am uh, smart enough to realize that it didn't come out of nowhere. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. I also don't think you're dumb. (laughs) No, I'm just dumb (laughs) in different ways. I am good at hanging up curtains. Yeah. Which you can't see unless you're watching the podcast. So you should watch it. Yeah. Or listen to it wherever you want. Who cares? But that's the end of Bonesmith. I like the book. I did too. Like I said, I'll read the sequel. Definitely. Sweet. I think the ending was much better than the beginning. Mm-hmm. It was a bit of a slow burn, but not in the good way for yes. me. Yes, yeah. Um, but I think it's a good book, and I would definitely recommend it. Yeah, I really enjoyed it a lot. I liked. I'm excited to see where all these characters go in yeah. book two. Me too, and I'm curious what they do with the ghost Smith powers. Mm-hmm. How do they make that interesting? Yeah, have to see. Yeah. Um. Oh, there's something else I was gonna say, but I forgot. I guess it doesn't matter. If you enjoyed this podcast, then keep it to yourself. (laughs) Don't tell anyone. We want it to be personal, intimate, with like two fans tops. Yeah. We want a really tight-knit community (laughs) of listeners. Our mom and our dad. Yeah, that's it. And that's it. Yeah. So, mom and dad. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. (laughs) (laughs) And don't share this with anyone else. If you come back next... Oh, my gosh. Come back next week. Join us. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about Assassin's Apprentice. I remember what I was going to say. By Robin Hobb. What? I was going to say this isn't one of my favorite books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is one of my favorite books, though. I really like it. Yeah. So tune in next week when I make Mallory read my favorite book, Assassin's Apprentice. Spoiler alert. My favorite book from last year. <laughs> yes. Favorite book from 2023. Yeah. yeah. Spoiler alert. 
it's boring. Okay. I'm just kidding. It's not boring. No, there are some boring things about it. That's okay. There's boring things about up. this, too. Yes. I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah. Me, too. And I think that's the end. I think so, too. Goodbye. Goodbye. Push all the buttons. <laughs> Turn it off.